younger generations of the Good evening. I'm calling to order the um, December 20th, 2018 meeting of the City of Boulder Planning Board. And we have a full house. Everybody's here tonight. Um, the first item on our agenda is approval of minutes. The November 15, 2018 minutes are scheduled for review. Did folks um, have any additional comments other than what was sent in? Now I'll make a motion to approve the November 15th minutes. I'll second. Okay, so we... I was absent, so I'm not gonna vote. Okay. So um, we have a motion by Bowen, seconded by Zuckerman, to approve the minutes. All in favor, say aye. 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 And one abstention. Okay. The next item on our agenda is public participation on um, items that are not on the public hearing ag agenda. Has anybody signed up to speak? No? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how this works. Am I supposed to sign in or something? Go ahead and speak and then sign in. All right, sorry. New with this. Um, I'm here to speak on the, the Rose parcel annexation. So that is one of our public hearing items? Oh. So well then, I really don't know how to do this, do I? It's okay, no problem. Thank you. you. Okay, so um, we have three call-ups. The first one is approval of a minor amendment to approved site review for a new 960 square foot community center located on the southeast corner of the property at 333 Pearl Street. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions for the applicant or want to call this up? 
Do you I have something? Just have, whoops. I just have a comment in reading this. I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Boulder Housing Partners for um, engaging the residents and when they and when they and some of the neighbors had questions about the community center that you were responsive and it shows up in the uh, new site plan. So thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So that one's not called up. The next item is a um, standard wetland permit, Southern Water Supply Project 2. It's a pipeline project which, which includes waterway crossings from Carter Lake South to Boulder Reservoir. Um, is anyone uh, on the board here interested in calling it up or have any questions? None. Okay, so that one's not called up. The next one is a site review amendment to modify the approved planned unit development and construct a ground-based 8 megawatt, 13 kilowatt solar array on the undeveloped parcel southwest of Monarch Road and 71st Street on the IBM campus. Um, anybody interested in uh, asking questions? No, but it sounds really cool. Yeah, <laughs> done. We should sure. totally do it. We want to <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, is the applicant here? They are. Um, not to call it up, but I'm just ask, wondering how you decide at what height to mount the solar panels because uh, I'm, there are possibilities that if they're mounted higher then cattle could graze underneath them or something of the sort like that. And I just was wondering to what degree that's considered. So you, could you come up to the podium and then please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Michelle Rios Allen from NextEra Energy, and we will be mounting the panels at a height, uh, making it available for sheep to graze. Oh, okay, so you have thought about that. Yes. All right, great, thank you. Thank you, sir. Could you stay up there for one sec? Sure. <clears throat> I, I just, uh, this is purely for me and not to waste the public's time too much, but um, what does the eight kilowatt or eight megawatt, 13 kilowatt mean? It seems like those are two very different I minutes. have not seen the 13 kilowatt, eight megawatt is correct. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's no, not 13, okay. Anybody else have a comment or question or anything? All right, so that one is not called up either. Congratulations. And yeah, a tour would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, whenever that's done. Um, so that takes us straight to our public hearing items. We have um, one public hearing item. So many people are leaving. I thought they were all here for our annual letter. <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to wait for press time. <laughs> Help us. Um, the uh, public hearing item is uh, public hearing and planning board recommendation on a request for annexation of the approximately two acre property at 5469 South Boulder Road with an initial zoning of residential low two, the annexation is also proposed to include adjacent South Boulder Road right-of-way and approximately 70-foot strip of city-owned open space land to be zoned public. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to staff for the Great. presentation. Thanks very much. Sloan Walbert will present staff's analysis tonight. Hey, um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Tonight's presentation as you said, is regarding an annexation of an approximately two acre property at 5469 South Boulder Road with an initial zoning of residential low two. Uh, the annexation is also proposed to include the adjacent right of way for South Boulder Road and an approximately 70 foot strip of city owned open space at 66 South Cherryville Road, which would be zoned public. And just to provide some background on the open space piece, in reviewing the proposed annexation map, staff discovered that there was a gap between the proposed boundary for the annexation and the open space boundary of approximately 65 to 70 feet. And that's the Van Vliet Ranch property, which was acquired by the city in um, 1978 for open space purposes. And when the property was annexed, the boundary was determined by a fence line, not the actual property line. 
So the applicant was asked to um, revise the annexation map to include that strip and sort of clean things up a little bit. So that's why that's part of this request as well. So for tonight's discussion, I will cover the review process, existing site conditions and surrounding context, the proposed annexation and community benefit. <coughs> I'll introduce some key issues for discussion and end with a recommendation to the board. In terms of public notification, the required public notice was given to property owners within 600 feet and a sign was posted on the property. Um, staff was contacted by a few neighbors to the north who communicated some concerns about flooding and groundwater, um, which were forwarded to the board. <clears throat> so the applicant is requesting annexation by petition as provided by state law. The land may be considered for annexation if it complies with the Colorado revised statutes and if it meets the policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And when a property is annexed, zoning is established according to the land use designation. So the purpose of tonight's hearing is for the planning board to make a recommendation to city council whether or not the annexation should be approved and the terms, conditions, um, and zoning that should be applied. And the city council would make the ultimate determination on the annexation. And just as a note, the property would not be required to complete a concept plan or site review in the future because they don't meet the minimum thresholds for the low density residential districts. But it, uh, it appears that they could do a voluntary site review if they wanted to request some modifications. <clears throat> so the annexation area is located north of and adjacent to South Boulder Road, um, east of Manhattan Drive. Like I noted, or as I mentioned, the city of Boulder open space is located to the south. And established single family um, residential neighborhoods are located to the north and northeast, which is considered Greenbelt Meadows, and to the northwest, which is Kaywaden Meadows. Surrounding properties also include um, the South Boulder Bible Church, which is located to the east on South Boulder Road. And there is some commercial lodging and multifamily residential uses located to the west across Manhattan and also to the southeast across South Boulder Road. <clears throat> the property is bordered by the city limits on the north and west. It is located in area two of the comprehensive plan, which is the area where annexation be can be considered consistent with annexation policies. The site is designated as low density residential under the comprehensive plan land use map with a planned density of two to six per acre. And the designation is described in the comp plan as primarily single family homes. And the open space area to be annexed is designated as open space acquired. The applicant has proposed a zoning designation of residential low two which is defined as medium density residential areas, primarily used for small lot residential development, including duplexes, triplexes, or townhomes, where each unit generally has direct access to the ground level. And residential properties are zoned RL2 uh, to the north, and there are residential properties to the northwest, which are zoned RL1. <coughs> Property is developed with a one-story brick ranch-style home and a cattle shed, which were built in the 1950s. They have direct access to South Boulder Road. Um, these structures in the side yard are shown in the upper photo. The home is on well water and septic systems. And as I mentioned, the section of South Boulder Road adjacent to the site is proposed to also be annexed, as well as that 70-foot wide strip of open space um, which is shown in that lower photo, that area. And Dry Creek 2 ditch runs along the western boundary of the property, which is shown in that photo. <clears throat> so to provide some context, this is a view of the existing home to the west of the site. Here is a view of the commercial properties across South Boulder Road. 
This is a view of South Boulder Road to the east. And here's a view to the west. You can see the flat irons in the distance. And this is a view of the existing single family home to the east of the property. <clears throat> the site is impacted by the 100 and 500 year floodplains of South Boulder Creek. There is a strip of high hazard zone along the west property line in the location of that ditch. <clears throat> and if the property were to be annexed, development within the 100 year floodplain would be subject to the city's floodplain regulations which would require the approval of a floodplain development permit. And that means that all new residential structures would need to be elevated two feet above the 100 year base flood elevation. <clears throat> and that means that no basements would be allowed. And the applicant has also been asked to give or grant an easement for flood control and drainage along the western feet, western 50 feet of the property. <clears throat> Um, so development potential does exist under the proposed zoning and the annexation agreement is written to anticipate any future development, although the current owner does not have um, a proposal in mind at this point. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go into some more detail later, but staff estimates that um, up to 14 dwelling units could be constructed on the property. <clears throat> and annexation policies state that Properties with significant rede redevelopment potential must provide a special opportunity or benefit to the city to offset, offset the negative impacts of additional development. <clears throat> and to meet this requirement, a community benefit package is proposed, which includes um, affordable housing on the site and some site improvements. So specifically, the agreement requires that 50% of new units constructed on the site must be permanently affordable. For each new market rate unit constructed, the property owner or the developer must pay cash in lieu in the amount of 25% of the cash in lieu amount required by the land use code. <clears throat> the first two permanently affordable units constructed would be priced to be affordable to middle income households earning no more than 100% of AMI, area median income and any additional permanently affordable units would be priced to be affordable to 120% of AMI. And as in addition to that, no new dwelling unit constructed uh, is allowed to have a floor area that exceeds 2,200 square feet, um, but that does exclude up to 500 square feet for a garage. <laughs> Um, but the permanently affordable units are required to be equal to that of the market rate unit or 1,800 square feet, whichever is smaller. Also, all new dwelling units must be duplex, triplex, or fourplexes. Um, no detached single family homes would be allowed and that's intended to maintain affordability on the site. <clears throat> and in addition to the housing requirements or restrictions, I should say, the when the property is subdivided or developed, the developer would need to construct an eight foot wide on street bike lane on South Boulder Road, as well as a eight foot wide detached sidewalk. They would also be required to construct a new access point from South Boulder Road, which meets our separation requirements. <clears throat> and I think it's also important to note that the applicant has worked with the city to help annex that open space land I described even though it wasn't part of their initial application and they did help prepare some of the necessary documents to do that. <clears throat> so the key issues identified by staff um, are whether the petition complies with the state statutes, whether the proposal is consistent with uh, city annexation policies, and the last one is whether the proposed zoning of residential low two is appropriate for the residential parcel. So um, regarding the state statutes, staff finds that the application is consistent with the, the statutes as described in the staff memo and also on the screen. <coughs> uh, regarding the city policies and comprehensive plan policies, as I described earlier, annexation of area two properties <laughs> can be considered consistent with these policies and staff finds that the annexation meets the applicable policies. The proposed affordable housing restrictions provide a significant community benefit. 
Um, in addition to that, the annexation would allow connection to the city's water system, and which provides a public health benefit um, by providing safe and quality drinking water. Uh, also reduces a public health threat that can occur from failing septic systems. Um, and just as another note, the city-owned open space is designated as Area 3, but it is eligible for annexation because it is a publicly owned property, and open space land does not require the full range of urban services. <clears throat> um, regarding zoning, the zoning must be consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land use code. As I described, the property is designated as low-density residential, um, which is typically a range of two to six dwelling units per acre. The only applicable zoning districts in this density range are residential low two and residential low one, which are both found in the vicinity. Um, the primary difference between these districts is that the intensity of development in RL1 is determined by a minimum lot size, and in the RL2 it's determined by a minimum open space requirement. <coughs> Um, in addition to that, our, the RL2 zone allows both attached and detached units, whereas RL1 only allows detached. <clears throat> so generally, area zoned RL2 in the city are along the eastern and southern boundaries, um, with some pockets in North Boulder and Gun Barrel. <clears throat> As this property is along the eastern boundary and um, is adjacent to other another development that is zoned RL2, staff finds that this is consistent. Um, and the approximately 70 foot strip of open space would be zoned public consistent with the land use designation and the adjacent open space. So to summarize, staff finds that the annexation is consistent with state statutes and the city's annexation policies. And staff also finds an initial zoning of RL2 and public is consistent with the land use designations and is compatible with surrounding properties. Therefore, staff recommends the motion, which is shown on the screen and also in the packet. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Do we have questions for staff? Anybody? Priscilla? I do. Um, so on North Illini, Illini <laughs> does it, uh, is there a pedestrian easement through that little cul-de-sac? Uh, through the cul-de-sac to their property? Yes, doesn't no. look like it. No, there's not. It's um, all private backyards along this property. And then the other question is, are basements going to be prohibited in as part of our annexation agreement? It's not part of the annexation agreement, but effectively they'll have to meet the floodplain regulations, which would prohibit basements. Okay, I just wanted to yeah, be clear on that. Okay, John. Yeah, just to uh, pursue the, uh, the uh, pedestrian access from the north, I understand it's all private uh, lots connecting to that uh, that dead end directly to the north. Is there any chance in the future of, uh, of public pedestrian access ever coming through there? Is there any plans of that type or? There even? is not any connections planned as far as I'm aware. I think the idea would be that you would travel along Manhattan. There is a detached sidewalk along Manhattan to the west. Okay. and. And then the property that's to the south of South Boulder Road, mm -hmm. is that already owned by the city? It's already owned by the city and it was annexed, I think in 94. So it, I think we think it was a mistake that that gap was created. And so we're just trying to clean that up. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? I have one more question. Okay. We, um, I think it, we got a letter from a member of the public who lived nearby mm -hmm. that had some questions about the impacts to their property and their basements on the north. Did you see that, Edward? Oh, good. Did you have any response to that? 
Good evening, Edward Stafford, Public Works Development Services. So generally it's one of the challenge areas because it is a groundwater related issue and as uh, the board's very aware, we have minimal groundwater regulations and certainly in terms of the impacts of development. Um, they've highlighted that they believe that the infiltration from this property may be adversely increasing that water table, which is certainly possible. We wouldn't have the technical data behind to show that, of course, uh, because that's not a study that's required or something that we analyze or look at, um, but it certainly could could be happening. The trade-offs in the area, of course, are infiltration versus flow from the, this particular lot as it developed, or if it develops, I should say, um, they would be required under our design and construction standards and the Boulder Revised Code to attenuate the flow overland of their stormwater, which may involve the building of a detention pond facility. Um, the, that would mean potentially some infiltration into the groundwater, but really the reason for the detention pond is to slow down the flow into the floodway so that you don't pass on a greater amount and potentially have an overland flood problem adversely impact the uh, <coughs> joining properties to the downstream properties. So there's always a trade-off there, and yes, when you hold water on a property, it certainly does have some level of infiltration, which will end their, into the groundwater table. So did I read the memo correctly that you, that it said, I could I could be wrong on it, but that during the technical document review, that's when the floodplain data would be submitted to show that you would cause, you know, that you're not gonna increase flows, et cetera, onto other properties? Correct, that's when you know they have a development plan and we would look at the technical, including the drainage report that would be required to show how they were conveying their flows. Now that would be at that time for any design of a detention facility if they were to trigger its requirement and to ensure that they were at least matching historic flow patterns. And then uh, like the letter writer, sh this person would have mm -hmm. access, they'd have to be put on a list to say, could you send me the report when it comes up, because usually uh, planning board doesn't review those documents. Correct, there is not a public outreach or a public process on those documents. They're an administrative staff technical review and approval um, as per the code and the design and construction standards. So that it's not something that we put out a public notice for, um, nor do we solicit public comments in the review of those types of documents. Now, if they were to do something to trigger a site review or other public process, there would of course be the public comment that's intended as a part of that, but if it was to be uh, strictly a technical by the right type project adhering to the codes that allow it to move forward without a process of, that has a public component, then there wouldn't be that opportunity built in. But that said, the plans, tech plans are published on the city's uh, development review project website, so if somebody wanted to access so them. So people see, should check that and mm -hmm. see right. how they might be able to review that. So one other thing you mentioned, uh, we don't have criteria for groundwater impacts, and we know that, we hear that whenever these projects come up in these uh, areas with a lot of groundwater. But is it on anybody's work plan in the foreseeable future? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. John? Yeah, just to, uh, thinking about the drainage easement along the west side, that's a Dry Creek number two ditch. Correct. Uh, does, is there a drainage easement associated with that ditch going to the north of this property also? I would have or to look to see what's been granted because it's a combination uh, flood control and irrigation. There is likely at least some prescriptive rights to it. I'd have to look at the mapping. I don't know whether Charles has that pulled up and if not, I can. Well, I, I'm sure there's prescriptive rights associated with the, you know, the carriage of water for irrigation. But I'm just looking at it and in other areas, there's been some potential for for bike and pedestrian uh, use of that easement as well. And I'm just wondering if if you've considered anything like that. So generally we consider that as a part of the overall uh, transportation master plan and connections plan so that indicates which of those drainage ways we intend to have multi-use paths. The Dry Creek Ditch number two is not one of those. Um, and so we, we, we did not exact a, a requirement for any kind of multi-use or pedestrian bike path through there. And there is no plan that I'm aware of for one along that section of Dry Creek Ditch number two. So do you, do you, was it actively considered and decided not to, or has it just never been considered? I would say it was considered as a part of the transportation master plan work and connections plans works work. We don't reconsider those in each individual application such as this. 
Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Harmon? Just, just a technical kind of question. Um, how is it that um, the applicant can be the only applicant on the application when city property is being annexed as well? Was the, can you help me understand why the city is not a co-applicant here? Is your mic on, Hella? Um, the annexation statute allows for that. So when you look at how many people signed the petition and what their ownership in the property is that's proposed to be annexed, it excludes right-of-way and city-owned property. Mm -hmm. Because if the city is the annexing body, you don't really need to sign an annexation petition. Okay, thank you. David? <clears throat> and on a related note, the, it seems like there's uh, that little strip actually extends further east on that side of South Boulder Road. Um, is there a reason why we wouldn't go ahead and do that at this point as well? Um, yeah, we're aware of that, and we considered it, but we just decided because the two properties to the east are also eligible that we would follow the same process as they came in. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I forgot to ask everybody to please, um, if you've had any ex parte contact or have any other disclosures to please make them. Uh, does anybody have any? No ex parte contact. I've visited the site. Okay. No ex parte contact. I have visited the site several times, but I was on this, the planning board mm. for, I think, three of the Hogan Pancost <laughs> uh, hearings, and there was a lot of testimony from Greenbelt Acre um, residents about the problems with their basements and their concern about flooding okay. for due to additional development, which would have been on the Hogan Pancost site. Do you have any? Just site visits. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any ex parte contacts other than having been on the planning board for the Hogan Pancost hearings. Uh, similarly, nothing. Nothing. Just two Hogan Pancosts. And a site visit. All right, thanks everybody. Okay, <clears throat> now we'll uh, go to the um, applicant presentation. Um, good evening, my name is Richard Lopez. I'm a city planner and attorney. And I'd like to introduce uh, Sheila Alberson, who's going to introduce the, uh, the members of the family. Hi, I'm Sheila Albertson, and my. Could you speak into the microphone? Oh. I'm sorry, but we're, we're yeah. trying to record it. So. Okay, yeah. um, I have two sisters and a brother here. I have another sister who lives in Wyoming now, so she's not able to be here tonight, or she would be. So, they're sitting next to me on either side. David is my brother. Mo on the right of him and Mary on the end in the red That's, and one other sister right. so. okay thanks yeah anything else I'll just give the background and if, you, if I miss anything you let me know I'll try. okay good evening um, when um, the Rose family came to me uh, they came after learning that their property uh, was not a legal building lot in the county uh, they tried to sell and realized that they couldn't. Um, at that time, we discussed the possibility of annexation. It was contiguous to the city. Um, it, it seemed like a, a possibility. But because it's five uh, adults that are going to make this decision, uh, we took it very slowly. We took it step by step. So uh, they got their uh, notice from the county in January of 2017. That it was, it was not a legal building lot. So we proceeded with a annexation feasibility study just to see if it would work, and it was less expensive. Um, in October of 2017, we learned that it, it was feasible. So then it was time for the family to go back and decide whether they wanted to take the next step, which is applying for annexation. Um, it's a much more expensive proposition. Um, so it took a little while for them to, to uh, make that decision and gather the resources. So we've applied for annexation. They are not developers. 
They have no development plans for this property. They simply want to annex it to the city and um, see if someone out there would be interested in purchasing it. Um, they've committed to, as part of the annexation agreements, affordable housing requirements, uh, floodplain easements, um, setbacks from South Boulder Road, and worked with the, the city to clean up that lower strip. So it's a, uh, it's a very a simple annexation, I think you've seen in a while. Um, and we're re requesting that you recommend approval. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? I have one. What is the issue that it's not a legal building site in the county? Why is that? It, it stems from uh, a division or sale of some of the land, and uh, as a result, it produced a smaller lot than is a legal lot in the county. Mm. That was the uh, um, from Robert High, the planner in the county. So when our dad sold the back two acres, the Greenbelt right. development, he sold those two acres. Somehow the laws have changed since then. Uh, yeah, we can't really hear what's us. happening over there. Okay, let me uh, let me see if I can summarize. Okay. Uh, I think it was 89, mm -hmm. 1989, their father sold the northern two acres. That little part that you pointed out, uh, Mr. Gersel, uh, with the cul-de-sac was previously owned by the family. They sold it, and then that was developed. By selling it, and then the regulations changed, I guess, because it all of a sudden became uh, illegal. It's not sufficient size to be a legal building lot in the county. Right. So that's why we're here. It changed to 35 acres, right? Right, it was a 35 acre, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I think, if, if I can, just um, maybe to clarify, um, I think probably what happened was that it, it may have been a legal building lot when it was four acres. It was four and then you sold two, right? Mm -hmm. And by taking even a few hundred square feet, deeding it to someone else, um, you lose your legal building lot status in the county if you have under 35 acres to begin with. So it was never a conforming mm -hmm. lot since the county adopted 35 acre zoning, but by taking any of the lot and selling it or alienating it to another party, changing the lot boundaries, you lose the building lot. That's the county's policy. I see. Thank you. Okay. Crystal. I have a question, and I don't know if it was staff or the applicant that suggested the properties be RL2 rather than RL1. You've got RL, I mean, for the zoning, the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, I understand that designation, but you've got LR, L, RL1, on the west and RL2 on the north, the zoning categories. Do you have that map, Sean? Yeah, so we're familiar with it. And I was just wondering sure. why you selected the RL1 zone I mean, the RL2 zone rather than the RL1 zone. It, it seemed to be a fit for the, uh, the area there. You have RL to the north, uh, to the west. Um, it seemed very logical. Doesn't R RL1 prohibit a detached housing, which was a condition of getting more affordability in? Attached, yeah. Attached, that's right. Yeah, I just was wondering. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. I think, uh, are you finished with your, your presentation? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we go to the public participation portion of the hearing. Um, Cindy, folks are signed up. One, okay. If you would like to speak to this issue, now is the time to come up to Cindy and sign up. Um, okay, Rudy Fettig, and you have three minutes. Okay, I better speak fast. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm one of the neighbors that lives to the north. Um, my direct neighbor is the one who wrote the email that I think you saw in your packet. 
Am I allowed to hand you guys pictures of anything? Yeah, you can give them to Cindy and she'll hand them out. Give them to, well, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. They're photos of what happens when it rains. And I'm not talking about just massive days, days, days of rain, but I mean, it takes a significant rain. But what happens, what we've, they've created here is already a detention pond. Thank you. Something needs to happen with drainage here that the water ponds just like this. In fact, that's when it's already drained away. The only place the water has to go is into the ground and into our basements. There's no drainage whatsoever on this property. And my concern is, um, Sloan was, was great in communicating me, with me by email, but she sent me an email and she said, what the, the developer's gonna have to demonstrate is that historical and developed runoff conditions will remain with the proposed development. So if what they're saying is to develop this, they're gonna create a detention pond on the property. That's what's there and that's what doesn't work because it has nowhere to go but downhill into our entire development. It impacts everybody in the cul-de-sac and beyond, and not just when we have a flooding incident like we did in 2013, but I've lived there now for 25 years. I was the original owner of the home. Unbeknownst to us, our property is five feet higher than the lowest point of the property where it meets our lot line, and it, it create it's just a lake, you know? We'll hear frogs out there, you know, chirping away because it's a literally a pond during times of heavy rain. So it, it seems to me, we have no problem with the annexation. We'd actually be happy, I think, with some construction and development there because the hope would be maybe the drainage problem could be resolved. But when I read some of this stuff, it makes it seem like it's not gonna be resolved and this is the opportunity to resolve it. Can something be put into this annexation agreement that requires a developer to, to, to fix it? I mean, if there's gonna be a flood drainage easement directly to the west, can't the water be taken to that and drained away? Uh, number two, I know I'm running out of time, is uh, we have no problem with uh, the RL2 zoning. That's what our development is zoned. But if you look at that, you'll see there's no duplexes, no triplexes, no quads anywhere remotely close to this area. They're all single family homes. I, you know, all the, uh, the east side of Greenbelt Meadows are very, very small detached homes that would be consistent with what's in the area. But to come in here now, when you've got everything built out as single family detached homes, it's not appropriate to stick a bunch of, of duplexes and quads and such in there. It's certainly not consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Was that be my uh, yeah. go away notice? <laughs> but um, I have a question for you. Could you describe uh, this picture, is this your backyard in the foreground and then the... Um it's it's the neighbor who submitted the, uh, and I'm right next door to her to the east. Okay. So so yeah, I'm, I'm essentially, I look at the same thing as, as that photograph looks like. Okay. And your lot is five feet above this water level that we'd see in the picture? The so. fence line, you see the fence in her backyard? That's the lot line, of course, between the properties. If, if you look on the other side of that fence, yes, it drops approximately, I think five feet is maybe not quite that much, but mm -hmm. it, yeah. So I should say that's the drop from South Boulder Road. So it, it comes down, hits our lot line, and then our developer obviously brought in fill in, built our homes up, put the fence on, and now we have our homes. So yeah, so that it just created a natural pond. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Do you have a question, John? So just to clarify on this drainage issue, you're, you're, not, you're not claiming that they did anything to their topography of their land. It, it's your developer who, who altered the topography and thus caused the ponding to occur. That's so, correct. Uh-huh. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nobody else signed up, Cindy? All right. So then I will bring it back to the board for deliberation. Um, does anybody want to start? Crystal? Could we ask a question of yeah, yeah. staff? Um, I don't know who to ask this to, but Edward or or Charles or Sloan, but um, 
the issue that this gentleman brought up um, about some kind of detention. So you said that would be handled in the technical document phase. Correct. That would be in a technical document phase of any development that was planned out here, and it would depend whether they triggered the need for a detention pond. So it depends what's built here ultimately. And then, thank you. And then, um, is this something we could put in to the agreement, to the annexation agreement, besides, sh you know, requiring that the water be conveyed wherever off the, away from the properties to the north? I personally don't well, look to develop a new engineering standard tonight. Well, I just let I uh, let's just, just ask that, and that's a good point. But we typically have a requirement in our annexation agreement that um, the drainage, historic drainage, be maintained, and and we can't really change the drainage of a property if we're saying you can't drain, you can't affect the drainage to the north, and we might be negatively affecting another neighboring properties. That property and um, and thereby creating a trespass situation. Generally, you have to drain consistent with historic drainage under state law. Thank you. And my my last question, the staff, is, um, you know, I asked the applicant why RL two over RL one, and the reason behind asking that question is, um, we heard a lot of testimony from neighbors that's part of Hogan Pancos saying that the increase in hard surfaces could affect their properties by increasing basement flooding. So with RL1, you'd have fewer units, probably fewer parking and hard surfaces. So I don't know if Sloan or Charles, why that, why you chose one designation. I mean, I could see on the north, it's a continuation of the properties to the north. On the west, it would be a different designation. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So um, there is an analysis in the memo about the difference between RL1 and RL2, yeah. and we felt that RL2 uh, was consistent with those lots to the north. Um, it is single family homes, but they are um, small lot, it's small lot development. Um, and we felt like even if there was attached housing here, it would create a transition between South Boulder Road, which is a principal arterial road and single family development. So it could act as sort of a transitional element. Um, and as I described, RL2 is generally located along the east, eastern and southern boundaries of the property, which this would qualify as. And I would also add that um, the ability to do some form of duplex, triplex, um, uh, again, I, I think part of the um, intent was to uh, try to build in some affordability as well. I, I believe the RL, let's see, no, I was thinking the uh, residential high, but go ahead, that's fine, thank you. Okay, um, John. Yeah, uh, just a question maybe for Mr. Stafford. How, what, what are the typical sorts of drainage uh, uh, developments that might be associated with this property uh, when when the time comes for for that decision to be made. Sure, the typical point is going to be how many lots they create. So we do have a provision that if there's only two lots created in the subdivision, then drainage and, and detention doesn't have to be introduced. Three lots or more would require that. And to clarify um, on the detention, a detention pond may have to be built. That doesn't mean it's in the exact location where there's water ponding on that lot today. It would have to be built in a way that it would capture the flows that would be running through that property to discharge them at that historic rate. And Dry Creek Ditch Number Two is the historic drainage pattern north. So it, it could be 
in a slightly different location, of course, ultimately at that low point for the drainage through there. Even without a detention pond, they'd still be looking at ensuring they were uh, pointing those flows towards that historic pattern, again, that Dry Creek Ditch Number 2 area. So, it so, so does the Dry Creek Ditch Number 2, is that actually the present uh, drainage for the property? It wasn't obvious from that ponding that it was moving into the Dry Creek Ditch. So I suspect what's happening in terms of the property is there's some, there's either natural or have graded at some point, low points in there that just don't have an outfall to get off of there. So you're gonna see that kind of ponding, anything flowing above that or that can outfall from those low spots generally is going towards, and in just case I'm sure going to Dry Creek Ditch too, because the, the neighborhood to the north is on fill that would block any flow from going that way. Um, right, so, but I'm and that's also why you'll see even in the flood mapping that there's some high hazard along Dry Creek Ditch too because there is a greater velocity or flow depth because things are happening to fall within there. There had been a question earlier even on whether Dry Creek Ditch 2 is within an easement and actually looking at the mapping sitting back here. Yes, there were drainage and utility easements in both those subdivisions to the west and to the north to accommodate that drainage way. I see. So, so it's clear that that the the, net, the existing drainage of that property is to Dry Creek Ditch Number Two, and not, for example, to the east, which is correct, undeveloped and correct. I see. Thank you, mm -hmm. Peter. Yes. So the historic drainage is Dry Creek Ditch, not the backyard area that we see in the picture. You know, it's hard to say what happened when they built the neighborhood to the north and brought the fill in, whether they realigned any of that towards Rye Creek Ditch Number 2. Obviously, today, it can't flow across those yards because of the differential, and so that historic pattern has been established through that to be towards Dry Creek, Dry Creek Ditch Number 2. There have, may, may have been, prior to any development in here, a little bit more straight overland flow rather than all to the west there, but that's the pattern that's now developed. The flow is trying to go north, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through Dry Creek Ditch Number Two. And so, if it were to, if there were to create a detention pond and use Dry Creek Ditch Number Two, could the detention pond be closer to South Boulder Road, where you'd want setbacks anyway? Any developer would want. Is that even possible because that buys some room for the it's really going to depend on the grading of the ultimate development and how you can make everything flow and work in a reasonable <laughs> sure. form not something i can say tonight that yeah. yeah that would be the the appropriate corner for it more than likely it would not be because it's probably higher to that side given that dry creek ditch number two is also flowing to the north and just looking at the grading on that it's there's about four feet of fall across the site so you wouldn't be able to get the low points back to a detention pond on the south uh, edge of the property so, okay. Okay. Are you uh, following up or? Yeah, just a okay. point of clarification. I just don't want to have a lot of cross conversation. Mm -hmm. that everybody hasn't had a chance to. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to, to ask um, so the southerly 55 feet of Rose Parcel has been dedicated already to Boulder County, or is it apparently it has been on film 1400 at an old reception number? So there's a, there's a lot of. The, um, the frontage on this parcel that's in South Boulder Road, and then an additional, is there any additional dedication for the bike path that's gonna be built with development? Thanks, Sloan's checking the file. I don't believe there was any additional dedication identified that the, the existing dedications were adequate to meet the, the long-term need. But let us double check. Yeah, there's an additional 10 feet of right of way along the south. Boulder Road property line. That's coming in okay. with, with the annexation. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I stand corrected. Thank you, Hella. Okay. So, Cindy, um, I sent you a file. And I guess I, I think I'll go next if that's okay with everybody. Are we doing just questions? Or are we doing the criteria? Or what are we no, this is to our deliberations now. Okay. Um, we have three issues, but I'd like to, since we're talking about drainage and flooding and stuff, um, this is from the city's flood uh, map. And it shows, this is the map of floodplains, so it's not the um, 2013 flood or whatever. And it shows the city properties, the properties that are within the city boundaries have the 
saturated colors, and then the county is the washed out colors. And you can see Greenbelt Meadows is that piece, that rectangular piece that sticks out towards South Boulder Creek. And the property that we're talking about is between Dry Creek, ditch number two, Bealy Channel, which is that little um, thing in the middle, and then the uh, South Boulder Creek. And I don't know if you guys remember, but when we saw Hogan Pancost, Alan Taylor, who was um, like a utilities director or floodplain director or something like that for the city back in the, uh, when the Greenbelt Meadows was developed, he said that they approved bringing in four feet of fill to put that neighborhood on top. And I, I have that, um, that, that was recorded and I've listened to it multiple times. So I, I think that jives with what the neighbors have said about their neighborhood being higher than this Rose property. Um, so to me, it looks like this property is still well connected to the floodplain. Um, South Boulder Creek is just uh, to the east slightly. Um, anything that you'd have to do substantial fill to build in this property, obviously, because of the water ponds on it. And building on the, or a fill, fill on the property will reduce the floodplain and take the property out of the floodplain, but it also reduces the area available for the water to uh, spread out during the flood. Um, I just don't see that ne this necessarily meets the annexation criteria. Um, this first one, this uh, state statutes for annexation, there's one about um, community interest. I understand that there's a proposal to put affordable housing or there's a requirement they would put affordable housing. I wouldn't put affordable housing there because it's so prone to flooding. Um, South Boulder Creek, especially this part of South Boulder Creek, we have documented photographic evidence of how frequently that floods. And so why would you put the m most vulnerable populations there? Um, and uh, Let's see. I think that um, right now we don't have, if we annex this, then the buildings there would just be subject to our building codes, which are not particularly updated for any kind of um, climate change or the impacts to extreme events from climate change. So we're working with the uh, 100 year and 500 year delineations based on historic hydrology and not on any kind of future hydrology, which is pretty well um, accepted that that's going to change and it's actually changing now. So uh, I don't think that our current approach is really adequate once we, once a property is in the city. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned about annexing it before we get adequate regulations in place. And there are communities that do address this, take this really, and not that we don't take it seriously, but they have been more proactive about it. Um, and this is through annexation, we can be more proactive because we don't have to necessarily uh, allow development in the, you know, the, we don't have to necessarily follow the existing floodplain development codes. We could impose different standards if we wanted to through annexation. Um, one of the communities that's actually taken this really seriously is um, Fort Collins. And after their 1997 flood, they put in some standards that were much more rigorous and it saved a lot of their structures for the, um, from being flooded in the 2013 flood. And I'm gonna read something from the Pew Charitable Trust about Fort Collins and how they approached development in the floodplain. So if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Um, the city, which lies 65 miles north of Denver, upgraded its building codes in 2000 to prohibit residential construction within the Cache Laputer's 100 year floodplain and require new non-residential development to be built at least two feet above the floodplain. Even stronger codes have been imposed on critical facilities such as schools and police stations. 
barring their development even in the 500-year floodplain. These provisions spared numerous structures, including a business park during the 2013 flood. Of the 14,000 structures built in Fort Collins since 1997, only eight were damaged in 2013. Over the years, officials have also preserved more than 66% of city land within the Cache La Poudre's 100-year floodplain. That land, now occupied by parks and other open spaces, gave the 2013 floodwaters room to spread out, slow down, and be absorbed without threatening structures or lives, protecting residents and businesses while providing new recreation areas. So, I mean, this is kind of my same old story, but I really don't think we should be putting uh, people in danger. We're, it's, we're endangering life and property by uh, building in the floodplain, especially the South Boulder Creek floodplain, which we talked about before, which floods over and over and over. Can I, so, can I just ask a question? Because I'm not sure I understand the reality of that regulation. Because I'm reading the Fort Collins uh, Castle Pritter floodplain handouts right now. And what you said was it doesn't allow you to build in the floodplain and it requires you to um, elevate two feet above the floodplain. City of Boulder's regulations already require you to elevate two feet above the floodplain. And my read of that is that by virtue of doing that, you're not building in the floodplain. And that's what these sectional diagrams show in Fort Collins's handouts on floodplain development. Mm -hmm. They show that you can still build in the floodplain but you just can't, you have to elevate two feet above the floodplain. So I think actually our regulations are the same as theirs. So their regulations say they prohibit residential construction in the 100-year floodplain, and residential and construction. And they're doing that by elevating it, which is what the diagrams show. No, because the this, this discussion is, and actually the um, there's more about this on the uh, Colorado Department of Homeland Security website too about the the, laudable efforts that Fort Collins has gone to. Um, so, so it sounds like you're both somewhat differing or arguing on something that none of the rest of us had in the packet or know about until uh -huh. this moment. I'm, well, I'm, that's why I'm reading that it to you. Okay. So. Yeah, and I, I think that I would want to find out from city staff or somebody else because I'm just reading the handout right here and it allows you to build in the cash computer um, floodplain as long as you elevate and by elevating it takes you out of the floodplain it may take a, uh, I don't know I haven't looked at that code but it, and taking a property out of the floodplain reduces the floodplain and so that's that's part of the my sure. point I'm not arguing with that you know, okay. I just think that they're I, I think my read of their regulation reading it right now is that it's the same as ours you know taking property out of the floodplain my understanding is is that it doesn't always have to raise the floodplain or impact the rest of the floodplain. In fact, it can't you know legally. Let's not so have this cross conversation. Yeah. Okay, we're it, How do you want to do it? Well, at our retreat, we Raise agreed that each person would speak once before anybody spoke twice. Well, so am I not speaking for the first time on this spoke. item? No, yeah, I'm talking. I mean, Brian, it's oh, so you. Okay. Be quiet. Okay. Brian. So so anyway, I just, you know, I would propose um, you know, maybe we, we need stronger language is what Liz is suggesting and maybe, um, you know, there just needs to be a condition uh, or a, a new paragraph in the annexation agreement that says that, you know, no new development can raise the base flood elevation. So if, if you do bring in fill, then you have to remove a commensurate amount of fill so that the BFE doesn't get altered and you don't put any more water on anybody else's property. I think that that could be part of it. But go ahead, Peter. I think Liz brings up great points. I, it does sound like there's ways to build around it in a way, or at least go with what we already have, the two feet above. The larger policy issue of what's left in Boulder to build that uh, is perfect or affordable or, or otherwise seems to be lessening, and it feels like we here's another opportunity to to do to get some affordability and there may be ways to do it safely as opposed to saying flat out no so i'd like to pursue that as much as possible however it's done to see that the paragraph is in there that does require your concerns to be met but at the same time allows us to work with what we have 
to address our housing crisis. Okay, who's next? Sean. John? Oh, sorry. Were you, did you have I go, ahead, go ahead. It was a collision almost, but <laughs> we raised our hands at the same time. Uh, but yeah, since we're going down this way, I'll. I'll take advantage. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I struggle with this. Uh, you know, every time we look at um, something, you know, that involves an annexation where we have potential for development in the floodplain, uh, I guess the, the problem that we face is that uh, a lot of what we discuss is, is sort of hypothetical based on what sort of a site review we might, we might, might happen or, or by right proposal might happen that would conform to the existing flood uh, regulations. Um, but I also don't, I, I also struggle with making the playing field uneven for folks when, you know, we've already put, you know, a number of homes in this area um, and now we're just saying, well, no, you know, no more, especially when we have, uh, like uh, Peter said, a lot of community benefits uh, from these conditions. So, um, so I'm, I, I agree with Peter. I think that, uh, I think that we, we have good conditions for affordability and this corridor is really wonderful from a walkable perspective uh, with open space nearby people can use and um, businesses nearby that you can use and with the new, uh, you know, multi-use sidewalk going in uh, that, you know, we're, we're, we'd be moving towards a really nice area for um, an RL2 type uh, development. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I, I, it does give me the willies that we're looking at a 100 year floodplain. I, I totally understand that. Okay. Uh, John? Yeah, I, I have a, a first a question for staff and then. Okay. Um, and that is with respect to the Dry Creek ditch number two, I think I'd be interested to know what the city's plans are for that ditch. And the reason I think that's in play is because, first of all, it's mostly owned by the city in terms of the land that it supplies, as well as the uh, share ownership of that ditch. And so I think the future of what happens to that ditch, which serves both as a drainage uh, function and a an irrigation a water carriage function is very interesting because in the future one could imagine that the drainage function would, would predominate, that there may be some uh, alteration of its uh, capacity to carry drainage water and that that would have some impact on the, uh, on the floodplain in, in the area we're talking about right now. Um, the, the other point that I'm just wondering about is that uh, uh, David made the very nice point that this is adjacent to open space across the street. But in fact, that open space is not intended for public access, I, I believe. There's no trails going through there. And uh, it's, it's primarily, you know, that's where there's buffalo grazing and cattle grazing occasionally. But I don't think that it's intended for the neighbors to go in that area and use it uh, for for uh, access. I may be wrong in that, but I think we should be clear about that when we talk about how appropriate is it is to serve the neighborhood. Can I just comment on that? Yeah. Since I, I, I use that open, um, that open space area a lot. The open space definitely extends uh, to South Boulder Creek uh, and then there is a trail that goes uh, almost, uh, certainly almost to Manhattan, but I just, I don't know the status of that trail. It's used uh, along this area that's being annexed, uh, but it may not be an official trail. But, uh, but, the, uh, but to get to the official trail, which would be right along South Boulder Creek, you would walk a few doors down and cross over. Right, well, I, I just yeah. thought you referred to the open space across the street, so we need I, yeah, I was just thinking about the general South Boulder Creek open space, uh, yeah. There is, a, but like like I say, there is a trail that everybody uses there. But you're right; it, it may not be that but that particular trail. Maybe it's nice yeah. to be next to it. Yeah, but yeah, it's a it's a cool amenity. place to yeah. yeah. But but I I just wondering if staff has had a chance to to respond to my questions about Dry Creek Ditch Number Two and its its future. Sorry. 
So Dry Creek Ditch number two, as you're aware, is South Boulder Creek, and so the entire area was subject to the South Boulder Creek mitigation planning efforts of the past numerous years, which has identified a number of different improvements in different areas. Looking at the recommended improvements uh, in this particular area, there are no changes to this stretch of Dry Creek Ditch number two that's adjacent to this property. There were proposals for either uh, piping or a wider channel further north of this property in the Greenbelt Meadows to then continue those flow flows to the north. You may recall some of that discussion even from our hogan Pancost deliberations in terms of what Dry Creek Ditch Number 2, which was on the west side of that property, would do. But in terms of the long-term plan, as it's based on this mitigation plan, there would be no changes to Dry Creek Ditch Number 2 in this area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Can I make a couple observations? Sure. So just if you... If you're curious about the uh, situation around Open Space Mountain Parks trails, the um, trail map is available online and you can look and it doesn't have any trails in that area. And it does map only the official trails, so it doesn't map the informal trails, which is a normal thing. And if you look at the transportation master plan, there's no future connection plan through any of those things. So those are all those things that you can look up and understand. Um, and on the floodplain thing, I think, you know, before we assert that, um, Fort Collins or any other entity has a um, standard we should adopt or we should use as a reference point, we just need to understand it fully. So that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not actually arguing with you on that. Um, and I'm actually not taking a stance at all on um, this question. I was just trying to make sure that I understand understood what you were trying to say clearly. Okay. All right, uh, any more comments, Kristen? I was I don't just actually know what we're even on right now. We're just talking about floodplains? Well, so I think that... Trying to be key issue number one, or where, where are we at? Well, since we just have this one item, we're just talking about it overall, I think, and what people's issues are with it, or not. So... Um, I mean, just a couple of concerns. It, um, so the whole floodplain discussion, we have a really good resilience section in our letter and maybe we can add a few other things to city council. I'd certainly add groundwater impact plans and some of the things that you've brought up, Liz, and we could even reference uh, some of the other cities. And on this property, it's, it's problematic because there's an existing house and they're just, they're trying to, you know, they're caught kind of between the county and the city and you want to, make, you know, and they're, they've come to us in good faith. And where I, um, where I have an issue is kind of what this gentleman said um, uh, in the annexation agreement, it says duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. But if you just added single family, we have a huge contingent in this community that keeps bringing up um, of course, more affordability, but also people want smaller units. A lot of people want that small, quote, tiny house. And to some people, a tiny house is 800 square feet. So if we just put in that one single family in that and some creative, if somebody bought the land or if one of you had an idea of having um, some smaller houses, then would be more compatible with the neighborhood to the north and might actually solve some of our, um, some of the need that people have for smaller houses. You know, when you ask commuters uh, the survey, what would, what would it take to get them to move to Boulder? Well, of course, you know, being able to afford something. But the first thing is single family house and it's followed by duplexes and then triplexes, et cetera. The last thing on the list is condos, but that's not on the list, so we don't have to worry about it. So I think I would like to see at least that opportunity to have small single family, as well as leave those other, those other options too. So are you saying that for number three, the initial zoning of RL2 is appropriate? If you leave RL2, I would, I would just like to have, rather than have it be just duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, I'd just put the single family in case somebody comes up with something that's really creative um, for smaller houses. 
Yeah, I'd love to make and it. And that's point. item L in the annexation agreement. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think that one of the things that would be a benefit of um, disallowing single family in that zone, I mean, aside from, you know, I think there's a pretty clear um, demonstration through the comprehensive housing strategy and, you know, folks like Lisa Morzal said we've already built all of the single family housing that we ever need mm -hmm. in this town, so yeah. let's not do any more. Um, I also think that, like, it would give them the ability to subdivide it into two properties, avoid dealing with the floodplain regulations, and do two very expensive big homes on big lots, which is essentially funneling this directly towards a large hot lots subdivision problem they're facing right now. So I'd say like if, if we do prohibit single family, it's gonna help avoid that outcome. Yes. Chris will go ahead. If you, well the annexation agreement does say 2,000 square feet is the limit. And we could also, we could change 2, that. Excuse me? 2,200, but 2,200. 2,200. And you know, you can always change, you can always put an addition in to address single family houses, smaller ones. I know it's all governed by, on RL2, by open space. So if you have eight units and you're required to have 6,000 square feet of open space, um, that's 48,000 square feet of open space, and you'd have 35,000 for the the lots and the, I think some of the roads count as open space or do they not or sidewalks or, yeah, it depends. Anyway. Peter. You could still have um, very expensive small houses too with very nice finishes and we'd therefore get exactly what we didn't want. Um, in terms of permeability, which is a great point you brought up, you know, permeable pavers and systems could be required. If you're worried that duplex would create more permeable surfaces or impermeable. Uh, but to clarify, you, you're bringing up the point about single family homes, small ones, so that there's an additional option, but would you hang your hat on that and refuse RL2? And I didn't. Would you hang your hat on that concept and refuse RL2 just because you wanted small houses, even though that's a loophole that could be exploited, which is the word of the week on council is loopholes. So it seems like affordability is clear and we've got that in the agreement. And so tinkering with RL2, except to say, let's have more permeable surfaces. I just wanna see where you stand on the idea of single family home, because to me that seems like a pretty big move away from where we are as a yeah. community right now. Crystal, go ahead. Um, the only reason I brought it up is all the North Boulder annexations have included, like the recent Tebow one, it was a couple of houses, and then I think council allowed them to do a couple more ADUs, I think we recommended that, detached ADUs. So I don't know, I just wanted to leave open the door for some creative stuff if someone wanted to come back and they had some tiny, you know, little structures. I know we don't, I don't wanna get labeled as, oh, she wants big, huge monster, single family suburban houses. Cause that, I just didn't want to preempt something. And I think you all know that a group of myself and some, other friends were the people that did the Affordable Housing Alliance that developed the Poplar Project, which was a whole series of cottages, and I believe that was in the RL2 zone, as a matter of fact. Hmm. And I don't think you call that suburban things we don't want, but, you know, I'm not going to die on that sword. I just didn't want to, you know, hearing all the discussion about tiny houses and this and that, I guess tiny is in the eye of beholder. Some people say 800 square feet. Some people would say 300 square feet. So we still don't have that defined. But that's my, that and the permeability, Peter. That's a, I'm glad you brought that up. That's another uh, issue. Okay, so um, I'm gonna have a couple more comments. I just, I really feel like the wise thing to do, because we're the planning board and not the permitting board, is to preserve that floodplain. I mean, in the long run, it will save the city money. 
because right now we're approaching $50 million for a dam upstream that won't protect this property at all, but because we built housing in the floodplain before. And so now here we're talking about putting yet more housing in the floodplain with no plan for mitigation, mitigating the flood that will come. And, we, um, and we're talking about putting the most vulnerable people in our community in that parcel, which I still don't understand why that seems like a good idea, because, I mean, I would prefer the mega, just the single McMansion there if we had to do anything, because at least they could afford to bail themselves out. They could put it on their credit card or whatever. But to put folks who are, um, some are going to be disabled, some are going to have small children, you know, in this uh, parcel that will flood because it's flooded multiple times before. Um, it just seems like not wise planning to me. And um, that's what we're about is long range planning. And you know, I am totally sympathetic with this family. It's very unfortunate that they have this property, but the, and then apparently part of it was sold off and that part was built upon. But I, I we can't make our planning decisions based on this kind of individual situation. Um, I don't have as much faith in engineering solutions, even though I'm a civil engineer, um, than a lot of folks have. And I, uh, um, you know, hope that we can all sort of come to grips with the fact that the planet is changing, the hydrology is changing, the extreme events are becoming more likely and more intense. And when it comes to land use planning, we don't seem to be really embracing that truth. So anyway, I'm not gonna support the annexation. I don't really see a good way around, um, um, around it, <laughs> you know, annex it, annexing it, and then allowing something to be constructed on it by either you know, raising the property and then taking it out of the floodplain or trying to come up with some engineering solution that moves the water around. I think it's, um, you know, Gilbert White said, it's better to move the people than the water. And it makes more sense to do that. So that's where I'm at. Harmon. So um, going down um, for me, the, the key issues for discussion. Um, the first one, does the petition comply with applicable state statute? Um, Liz, Liz uh, fixed on the bullet, there is a community interest between the property, and the statute properly says there is a community of interest, not a community interest. And this is a poorly transcribed um, bullet point here. So a community of interest is a term that means that the two parties have similar interests. And so all this says is that the city and the owner of the property proposed for annexation have their interests aligned. That's not a, a difficult criterion to meet if it's read properly. So I think that the annexation petition does comply with the state annexation statutes to the extent that it might not fully comply with the Boulder Valley comp plan, on the other hand, um, in increasing flood risk. Um, I would be fine with um, recommending another paragraph or two in the annexation agreement. Um, two examples of ideas for that would be to require that no development, um, but development is just defined as a subdivision in the agreement, so I think we have to say construction, um, would increase the base flood elevation, and then maybe another one where any new construction would, the finished floor height, it would have to be you know, three feet, the flood protection level for, for this, the flood protection elevation or FPE for this project has to be three feet instead of two feet, or has to use the 500 year floodplain as its BFE instead of the 100 year floodplain. And I might be butchering the engineering terminology, Edward, if I am, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, is the initial zoning of residential low two appropriate? I think it is. And, and I think that to the extent that um, multifamily development would provide a buffer from the high-speed traffic along um, South Boulder Road, 
it's it's absolutely the appropriate zoning for um, for this area. And you know, I, with all due respect to Crystal, I, I don't think I'd want to live in a maybe it would have to be a really beautifully designed tiny house village to be abutting a 45 mile an hour highway and have the kind of intimate scale that tiny house villages have. I, I think that the uh, duplex triplex quad um, is exactly what you want here, and and it it also uh, matches the introductory zoning district that um, that Boulder tends to apply in this area and since the 1970s in general. Okay, um, Peter. For the sake of efficiency, I would uh, agree with that and uh, second that idea. <clears throat> yeah, um, this, we can uh, weigh in on the key issues. Uh, yeah, I agree uh, um, with, with number one with Harmon's uh, uh, assessment on that. Uh, with number two, there are a number of places in the Boulder, Boulder Valley Comp Plan, uh, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, that talk about preserving floodplains. Uh, so th that is uh, an area where um, I, I do resonate with Liz's concerns. And I agree that it, I, I feel that there might be something we can add. Uh, uh, I agree with many of Harmon's uh, recommendations on that. And as far as RL2, I, I, I'm, I think RL2 is a good, uh, a good approach because it's the same as what of the properties to the north. And I think uh, uh, the mix of housing types does make sense to me as well. So the thing I would be really interested in is whether we can come to terms with some uh, language that would help us feel that we're being more proactive from a planning perspective on things that might be going into that floodplain. Do you want to? No, I, I've already said it. Yeah, in terms of the key issues, I, I agree with Harmon's eloquent and insightful way of stating all of that. Um, I do want to say a little bit about the floodplain. So I think, um, you know, I don't want to have this be characterized as a, you know, let's stick the poor people where it's dangerous kind of a conversation. I, I do think that the floodplain regulations, having been through a number of developments here in town, are quite stout, and the city takes it really seriously. I, I don't think we're um, being irresponsible by doing this. And also just looking factually at the topography and how the uh, 2013 flood happened and, um, and where the floodplains actually exist, um, this is actually not really contributing to the flood capacity of the South Boulder Creek system, which is about five feet higher and further over. This is actually in a, a spillover. If you look at the mapping and the topography closely, it's a spillover from the ditch onto the property. And I'm assuming I, you guys could probably confirm that or based on personal experience or, or tell me I'm full of it also. Um, and, you know, in terms of creating a, some stronger language around preserving the floodplains, I think that's something I'd feel comfortable with. But I also do feel like looking at the depth of the floodplain here um, and then whether I like it or not, looking at Illini Court and seeing how the elevation of that section um, has effectively removed them from the floodplain, both in terms of FEMA regulations and in terms of the urban flood extents. Um, it seems like that's actually proof that it's effective on those properties. Um, and then I think there's also, when you're doing a revision, to, I mean, there's basically a couple of ways that they could build in this floodplain, right? One would be to elevate the buildings that are there um, two feet above the base flood elevation, 100-year floodplain. Um, and the other one would be do a letter of map provision with FEMA and to remove some portion of the site from the floodplain doing calculations. And I, my understanding of that not being a civil engineer <coughs> um, is that uh, they have to demonstrate that there isn't a downstream uh, impact on other property owners. Is that correct? Ish? general spirit of it maybe, I don't really know for sure, but I feel like that math is sort of part of that thinking. If, you, if you're gonna get baited into coming up, <laughs> thanks yeah, Edward. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it to you, I don't wanna necessarily interrupt your deliberations. So generally under FEMA and city's guidelines, the 100 year floodplain in here, which isn't the uh, FEMA guidelines is considered fringe uh, area, could be filled without much analysis. Um, the conveyance zone is what helped control that, and you're correct, this is a spill area, so there's really not a conveyance zone. So yes, this area could be filled, a letter of map revision, revision based upon fill applied for and likely 
issued approved through both the city's regulations and FEMA would effectively remove it from the 100 year, although we do have a regulation that still applies floodplain development standards to areas that are removed by fill, so there would still be requirements for elevating the residential structures. Cool. Thanks, Edward. We appreciate that. So that's all I had to say. I'm comfortable annexing it, and I'm really happy to see that the mix of units that we're striving for is built in and high level of affordability and uh, diversity of unit types, all that sort of stuff. So. I'm gonna respond real quick. Um, so that map is the 2013 extent, which- Actually, if you look at that, it's the effective mapping. Oh, is, isn't that what you were just saying, you were, that you were looking at the 2013 extent? Because when at, I look at look the at actual floodplain map- um, this, is, this is that. See, mm -hmm. this is the okay. floodplain, and that's the- the darker one, the blue mm -hmm. one, is the 100 so year. It's this. And the lighter blue it's one. It's what, just to clarify, excuse right. me for interrupting. Yeah, it's the same thing right. as in the packet. That's right. And so you can see in that one, in that one, that the uh, Greenbelt Meadows is still, is in the 500 year floodplain. Mm -hmm. So it was not, you know, it's that all that fill didn't take it out of the floodplain. But I, maybe I should be more clear in my language. It did take it out of the 100 year floodplain based on looking at the, Mm -hmm. If you look at the topography in Illini Court, it's really clear you've got, um, it reflects the shape of uh, uh, curb drainage along the roadway and on the uh, cul-de-sac. There's elevated pad sites for each home. It's pretty standard civil engineering for something like that where they've, you know, removed something from the floodplain. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I also um, just wanted to add that there, you know, if you follow the floodplain managers, Association of Floodplain Managers, the floodplain thinking is changing, and it's, you know, even they, we've had these 100-year, uh, these building standards in place for a long time, but people are working and thinking more about trying to connect floodplains or keep intact floodplains and preserve floodplains and prevent development in floodplains. And I know that there are plenty of communities that do that. So anyway, uh, anybody else want to weigh in on? I think those two would like to have their turn. I'm looking at them. Um, well, on the annexation petition, you know, probably it is consistent with state statutes. I total, I think Liz's point, maybe we could talk about that under two for the comp plan policies. Um, every time we have a hearing with these tough properties, it brings up the issue of the information that we don't have or or standards that we should have updated and e and but we don't apply that right now to you know to what's before us um, or we can't apply it because we haven't got any new things adopted um, but one thing that's missing for me is I would like to know at some point at maybe at a study session exactly what properties are slated for acquisition for floodplains, especially in along, you know, South Boulder Creek. And in fact, in phase two, there's supposed to be some storage, but one of the sites was Manhattan Middle School and they built a field on part of that storage area. They built a gym. So I know that, that that's something I haven't, I don't know if you've identified additional sites, but we should be proactive about that and, this, and we should be looking at how to acquire them and what funds are needed. I just wanted to put that in there, but that's my long answer to number one. And I did like some of Harmon's suggestions. Mm -hmm. John, did you want to number one? I, I think this does comply with applicable state annexation statutes, but uh, I think also we need to keep in mind some of the conditions that the city council just placed on the CU South annexation arrangements, which have not yet been finalized, but one of them was that there shouldn't be any uh, permanent uh, building construction in the 100-year floodplain. 500 year. Uh, and so it seems to me that this is inconsistent with that consideration. 
why would we uh, move ahead with, as, as Liz mentioned, encouraging construction in the 100-year floodplain of facilities for those people who are least able to deal with flood disasters, and at the same time uh, prevent uh, a, a facility such as CU, which is presumably more capable of dealing with flood concerns, uh, from doing so. So it seems to me that this would be to move ahead not with annexation, but with encouraging construction of, for example, affordable housing in this area with this flood, uh, flood classification seems inconsistent to me uh, with what the city has, has done nearby previously. And uh, so I think that if there is some way to uh, deal with that question, then I think it would be reasonable to move ahead. But it's not reasonable and it's not in Boulder's interest to encourage construction in the 100-year floodplain when we have seen what damage can happen with the construction that has already occurred in the 100-year floodplain. I think Liz made that point very, very well. Um, so if there is some way to deal with that question, as, as Harmon suggested, uh, either by improving the drainage along Dry Creek Ditch Number 2 to change the floodplain classification of this property or some other uh, method, then I think it might be reasonable to move ahead. But until, that, until we have that arrangement in place, it doesn't serve Boulder well to move ahead. And therefore, I don't think it's appropriate to recommend annexation. John, okay. can I ask John a question? Harmon, I'm sorry? Can I ask John a question sure. about what he said? Yes, so. So um, did council uh, or is council considering applying a development prohibition on the 100? Because when it was in front of us, the city um, position to see Boulder South was no development in the 500-year right. flood. Yeah, 500, but that, I mean, that's even larger than the 100-year floodplain. Well, on this so, parcel, the 100-year the flood zone is most of the parcel and the 500 is just a small area. So if we were to be consistent with CU South, they, the, the development restriction would only be in the uh, southwest corner of the property. Mm, that's not right. I, I don't think that's <laughs> correct. I don't. Uh, Edward's shaking his head. Oh. What did you want to come up then? Anything in the 100-year floodplain is also within the 500-year right. floodplain. So the 500-year is an extent beyond. So if right. you turned off the 100-year, layer and just had the 500 year layer, all of that area that's shown in the darker blue 100 year would also show in the lighter blue 500 year. The 500 year floodplain includes the 100 year plus, plus, plus. Like all Pilsners are loggers, but all, not all loggers <laughs> are Pilsners thing. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Super sad. So has that negotiation been finalized? Well, I, I don't think it's been finalized, but that was the, uh, you know, Guiding one of the- principles. Pardon? The guiding principle. The guiding, mm -hmm. guiding principle. So given that that has happened so recently and it's right in the same area, yeah. it seems to me that we should be paying attention to it. So, you know, let, let me just make sure that I understand this, not being a hydrologist. The 500-year floodplain is a higher flood elevation than the 100-year floodplain, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's, that's for a flood that happens more rarely, mm -hmm. right? So there's more water in it, right? So then why would the 100-year floodplain be inside the 500-year floodplain? That just doesn't make sense to me. More like it's under it. I, think it's I get it that it's, it's under it. It's less but, area. Right, but the, the point with CU South was that in the areas of... It, okay, well, I think I get it now. Okay. Go ahead. So, Sorry. That's okay. Crystal, just to explore this idea, if you were if you were going to approve the annexation with the condition that you couldn't build in the hundred year floodplain, that would leave that southwest kind of corner. And if you said it could be RL two, you could put your open space. probably allow the house to you know have some um, 
be included in the annexation because it's existing and then have duplexes or whatever uh, in the southwest corner. I mean, is that something you could? So you have to remember there's that easement as well, the flood control easement on the western boundary. So effectively, there would now be no development potential. And excuse me, what did you say in the southwestern corner? So there's a 50 foot easement along the western property. Right. So if you okay. overlay that, you wouldn't be able to add any more. Okay, units. I get it. Thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so do folks want to talk about um, <laughs> item I, number two? Number two, I guess, <laughs> yeah. I, think we all, I thought we all ticked through all three. If you have anything additional to add for number two or number three, go ahead now, I guess, because we hashed this out quite a bit, so. John. I have uh, one additional comment, and that is, in general, the, the Several folks have said that it's more appropriate to build multifamily housing along a busy road. That's because it's less appropriate to have high-priced single-family or low-density housing. Somehow that was the implication. Uh, I'd like to go on record that it's not obvious to me that you want to have the least expensive housing, which I presume the multifamily buildings would be, along the busiest roads. Um, that's, again, uh, putting, putting the people who are least able to deal with issues at the greatest uh, risk of various types. Just the, if I may, yeah. the kind of common way people think about increasing density along transit corridors is because of the transit and providing better access to people who may not have access to cars. That's actually the genesis of putting more density along major roads. And if I can also add, the, the multifamily housing can have more bulk and mass in a more variegated way sometimes than a single family house and provides a, a better visual along a large road. So, you know, it's not just um, the way you characterize it. And also, you know, over and over again, I've heard, you know, putting the people who are least able to cope uh, I think people who make 100% or 120% of AMI in Boulder are not um, impoverished people. And as residents of brand new housing that's elevated out of the floodplain um, and built to modern engineering standards, um, I, I think they'll fare quite a bit better than a lot of the middle class homeowners uh, in my neighborhood. So uh, I'm comfortable with it. The unobstructed view south across open space to the mountains. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is, um, th there are two sides of, of the putting people in harm's way equation. I, you know, every place that we look at to build, you could be in Tornado Alley and maybe I, you know, maybe if we looked at the statistics, we would find the people who build in certain parts of the Midwest are actually more vulnerable to terrible things happening because of tornadoes, which are much less easy to predict where they're going to come. Uh, there's, there's, always, there's always a chance that a natural thing can come along. A um, hundred year is supposed to mean once in a hundred years, so maybe once in left, less than one of our lifetimes. And, and, and when that happens, if we, I think that our floodplain regulations are supposed to assure that we do our best to make sure that whatever is built there will, will be resilient and that we will have good ways to help prevent people from having real problems. Uh, right, so, so I, you know, yes, I, I would love to be able to uh, say that there's an easy answer to these things, uh, and, you know, planning board people are really good at thinking about urban planning, and maybe it's a little harder to, to weigh those, those things. It's, it's actually kind of a tough responsibility for us to have to, have to think about. Uh, so I've been wrestling with it. I wrestled with the fact that um, just a couple weeks ago, we, we looked at one where we um, recommended not no habitable buildings in the 100-year floodplain as part of the annexation agreement. Mm -hmm. And so what's different about this one? Well, they are different. So you South is different from that one and from, is different from this one. And this one happens to be in an area where a lot of neighborhoods have already been given the uh, go-ahead to, to 
be there even though it's a floodplain. And now um, I just, I hate to see, I, I hate to just be able to jump to the conclusion that I want to use the annexation as a sledgehammer to just kind of punish one group, group of people when in fact there, historically we've been allowing uh, this area to become a fairly well-developed residential area. So, uh, so that's, those are the kinds of things that I'm weighing that don't lead me directly to the conclusion that this annexation shouldn't be allowed. And uh, so I, I, I'm still hoping we can come up with good language that will make people feel better about this because I think it's, it's probably a, a good thing to pursue the annexation. So are you, you're not suggesting that we're being punitive by trying to preserve the floodplain? I mean, you said punishing. Well, um, you know, I have the interests of the, of, of the people who would like to be able to use this property in mind. So I just don't, you know, I'm trying to see how we can, mm -hmm. you know, work with them. Okay. That's all. All right. So um, this, it sounds like we've talked about all of the issues. Anybody have any more issues, or would somebody like to make a motion? Somebody like to offer some conditions on a motion? I'll let's let's get going and move on. I'll go ahead and make so. a motion. So, and I'll use the one up there to make sure it's not different from the one on here because I've fallen into that pitfall before. Um, I move that we recommend the city council approval of the proposed annexation with an in initial zoning of RL2 uh, for 5469 South Boulder Road and of public for the strip of city-owned land pertaining to the case number LUR 2017-00096 incorporating the staff memorandum as findings of fact subject to the recommended conditions of approval for the annexation as provided for in the annexation agreement attachment C in our memo. I'll second. Okay, any discussion on the motion? No? Nobody, go ahead. Crystal. Um, I'd like to make an amendment to the motion, um, and it would be to change the de zoning designation to RL1 and then change item L in the annexation agreement and just add single family, and then you could have duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, which you usually cannot have in RL1. So that would be my amendment. Can you <laughs> reword it <laughs> just to simplify the wording a little bit? Um, I would change the wording. Initial zoning of RL, I would change it to RL1. Okay. And then in the, in in the staff memorandum, uh, or subject to the recommendations for the annexation agreement, which you're in, attachment C under item L, I believe it's item L if you look, um, I would just add single family because that, that, um, that is what's mainly allowed in residential low, but I keep the other three designations, which we usually don't have in RL1. But it's an annexation agreement, so we could make these kind of changes. We're always told. I need to know when you're, we could when be you're, creative. Yeah, I was <laughs> trying to get it's when the motion ends and when the I'm when sorry. the justification okay, starts, that was, and that's where I was getting. So change it's actually item 18L. Excuse me. It's subparagraph L under item 18 in the Thank annexation you. agreement. Um. So my. Okay. I don't know if anybody's interested in seconding, and if they're not. I'll just drop that. That's okay. Can I just ask a question? What What do you accomplish by doing that? Well, what I wanted to accomplish is you'd have 7,000 square foot lots. You'd have less density, but you could still have your duplexes and triplexes. There's a possibility, maybe there'll be an amendment to limit it, uh, limit the amount of development in the 100 year, so it would push the development over to the transit corridor, and you can actually put the density there. Crystal, I mean, I would be half tempted just to, to agree with the, um, the amendment to the motion, but for different reasons, and, and I think it's important that you understand, at least the way I look at it, if you 
change it to RL1 with a minimum lot area of 7,000 square feet, but then you change the zoning to allow duplexes, triplexes, and quads, potentially you could be putting 50 or 60 units on this lot. Okay, well, Depending walk me how, through it. So you divide 7,000 into 83,000. Well, so RL2 has a natural limitation of the number of dwelling units. Because of the 6,000 square right. foot open But if you space. then allow quads on a 7,000 square foot lot, there's a lot of 7,000 square foot lots on two acres. Can I clarify there's something? <laughs> it's 7,000 square feet per dwelling unit. Yeah, but if you, yeah. I think that it would be subject to interpretation, Sloan, that's my point. That if you, if you look at the annexation agreement, which specifically calls out um, duplexes, triplexes, and quads, um, I'm not sure that it's that easy. I think it, it's contestable. So. so, okay. You know, I'll drop it, but I just want, because no one's going to second it. But if you divide, um, 7,000 into 83,000 square feet, you get approximately 11 units. But then I then to match that with the zoning requirement where you'd have to have lots, maybe that's not the best way of getting at it. Maybe a better way at getting at it would be to offer an amendment to not have development on the 100-year floodplain, leave all the rest of the conditions, and people could meet that, uh, and the development could occur in the corner and then we could address the single family house as an exemption from that. So you pull things away from the 100 year. You know, I'm trying to get my mind around this as well, given council's recent comments about, Brian brought up Lisa's quote, we have all the single family homes we need right now. Why are you pushing so hard to have single family homes here? I, I thought, I, I mean, I thought I explained it. So confused. And I'm wait, sorry. let me just tell you why. Because people have said they want to have tiny homes and tiny units. Tiny homes are tiny single family homes. Who, who are these people and what are you what what study are you referring to? Well, when you I mean, I'm the liaison to the HAB board. One of their recommendations to city council is to look at tiny homes. Okay. You know, I mean, hey, you might not want to admit it, but a tiny home is a tiny single family home. No, I definitely understand all that. I just, in the case, in this case, I'm trying to understand, I want to ask originally, where are you going to hang your hat on this as something you're going to push? And I'm still trying to understand it because to me, it just reeks of loopholes. Maybe it's the wrong way to go about it. I'll tell you what my goal is. The goal is to not build on the 100 year floodplain, but allow for building on the south, the southwest corner. And maybe I'll just state that, and then you can do the RL2 um, were, were you all on that Sorry. corner. Were you trying to get there by way of the single family home concept? Well, I just, I, you know, if no one else thinks it's a good idea, I'm just trying to be responsive to what people have brought up at housing forms and during the comp plan, we should have tiny homes. So if you, how are you gonna have a tiny home in a duplex? It's a tiny duplex. I guess you have a tiny duplex. Okay, so. But anyway, that's not going anywhere, so we shouldn't waste any more time on it. Yeah, all right. Okay, so are there any more comments or amendments or motions or anything? We have the main motion on the table. Um, I think I'm going to call a vote. Okay. Did Wait. you want to make another comment? Uh, well, I, I was going to suggest an amendment. Okay, good. All right. And that is that in addition to this language, we have a condition that all uh, habit, inhabited housing take place outside of the 100-year flood zone. I'll second it. So I'd like to comment on that. And I got word that the uh, the way we worded our last motion about um, putting habitable structures in the 100-year floodplain was not ideal, oh. and that there's a better way to word it, which is um, structure, I can't remember. Maybe. <laughs> Can you help me, you sent Edward? <laughs> Excuse me, if I may, Liz. Mm -hmm. Was this in reference to 
the Cherryvale, email. the Cherryvale one. The email you sent out. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi. So there are a couple of items I would advise you on for this. The first in terms of the initial terminology be structures intended for human occupancy. That's a recommendation because that is language that exists in today's floodplain development regulations of high hazard. So it allows a, an easier approach to analyzing it. The other word of caution um, with this, because as we've discussed earlier, this can be removed from the 100 year floodplain through fill. You actually may not have prohibited what you desire with that because the 100-year floodplain line could be changed and they would no longer be in there. I don't want to surmise what you're trying to do there, but I want to give you that advice that you may want to contemplate uh, what that wording should be. I think uh, Hella and I had a few things and she may want to chime in on this. Yeah, and if, if you want, I think what you're trying to do is prohibit structures intended for human occupancy in the 100-year floodplain. Yes. Um, the way you just worded it would have required them to be in the 500-year floodplain, but they, or I'm, it's I'm everywhere. Outside the 100 years is what I said. Yeah, so I, I would recommend to, to switch that language around to make that clear. Um, yeah, then there's this, the problem of the possibility of elevating um, the ground level above. So yeah, just to solution? clarify that, the, the owner could bring in uh, 100 truckloads of fill and elevate their, you know, change the contours of their property without any uh, approval by the city of any type? It would require approval, but it would meet our floodplain regulations. It's what happened to the north. Yeah, that was done 20 years ago or so. And, and is still legal under the city and FEMA regulations. And Violet Crossing up at Violet and Broadway did it about a year and a half ago. Uh huh. It's pretty common. Yeah, we've been Edward and I have been discussing different options to to achieve what you're trying to do. One of the things we discussed is a requirement that prohibits any construction that results in in a rise in the elevation of the 100-year flood. I'm concerned about that, and maybe Edward can talk about that. I'm, I wonder whether any construction would be possible, because this in this particular area, we, we use the Mike flood model to establish the floodplain mapping, and it is, it has a different technology than all of the the other floodplains in the city, and and almost any kind of change seems to cause a rise. Mm -hmm. We've been dealing with that on other properties in the city, not in the 100-year flood, but in conveyance zone areas. So that a prohibition like that might be prohibiting any kind of development on the property. So, so the, that's a concern we had with that. Um, another option might be to require elevation of any new dwelling units or structures on the property above what's already required under the code. So currently it's uh, two feet above the 100 year flat plane elevation. It would make these structures safer in a flood, but it, it wouldn't change any rise that may result uh, through the construction of new structures. <clears throat> Do you want to modify your motion? I don't see any land in this parcel that is not in the 100 year flood plane right now. And so, I, I don't know. Uh, I thought the southwest corner is is outside of the hundred year flood zone. Oh, okay, that's five hundred. Okay, you're right. And John, would you um, exempt the existing residents um, so it could be remodeled, et cetera? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would think that would be okay, accepted. Okay, so that would be in your motion. Also. Okay, now I have to figure out how to how to word it. Hella, I, I think your points are excellent. I'm trying to figure out how to how to say what what how to take into account your suggestions. How might we say that? Um, Maybe no new structures intended for human occupancy shall be constructed in the 100-year flat plane on the property. And that would address new structures. It wouldn't really, and it would allow the existing structure there 
um, it wouldn't expressly address modifications to the existing structure. It wouldn't prohibit it, but it wouldn't limit it either. I think what, what would limit it is just the current floodplain regulations that they'd have to meet, so depending on the size of uh, what they do or the cost of what they do, what whether they'd have to elevate or what improvements they'd have to make. So my interpretation of that is that the current floodplain regulations, as they would apply to any existing house in the 100-year floodplain coming in to do a remodel or expansion, would then apply. Yeah. One of, one of the things that we discussed with regard to prohibiting any new structures in the 100-year floodplain is that there hasn't been an analysis that, let's say, the existing structure would be demolished. There hasn't been an analysis what could be rebuilt in that area that is only encumbered by the 500-year floodplain, looking at setback requirements and so forth. Mm -hmm. But understanding that there's a 50-foot flood easement that's going to be dedicated to the west and um, you know, I was just kind of studying it a little bit here. I mean, the, the development potential would be small, if any. <clears throat> or if, if you just want to limit development on the property to a single dwelling unit, you could maybe say that and, and to try to locate it within the 500-year floodplain to the extent possible, and that might get to your concerns in a different way. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to figure out how to accomplish this in a in an efficient way. I don't necessarily I don't necessarily want to restrict development to one house on the on the property. I, I I'd like to. I, I want development to occur in a way that is appropriate, and to me, being appropriate means that it stay that it's completely outside of the hundred-year floodplain. Uh, what is being built, and just raising a building by two feet doesn't, in my opinion, remove it from the floodplain. So that's why I I'm I'm hesitating. Uh, I'd be open to suggestions if you... Can I ask a quick question? Sloan, what's the setback along South Boulder Road for this property going to be? I'll have to look. Hang on. Okay, sorry. I, excuse me, Sloan. I didn't hear that number. I think she said she's going to look it up. Oh, okay. That's why I didn't hear it. Was it 25 feet front yard setback in the RL1? Or RL2, I mean? Is it? While she's looking that up, David, did you hear Should I start on my, um, yeah. so maybe we can just um, explore a little bit um, the Dry Creek uh, Ditch number two uh, subject that came up earlier. Um, we talked about how there was uh, flood mitigation work planned for further downstream on that, you said. Um, is there, is there, uh, I do, I do feel like that, you know, this isn't in the, it isn't along the, the major South Boulder Creek high hazard corridor, so it does seem like there's a dependency on that dry creek ditch number two specifically. Um, is there anything we can do with that, um, or is it just sort of really based on things that are kind of hydrology analyses beyond our control, whether or not we go there and try to improve uh, drainage from this area. I mean, uh, you know, you go with it where. So, so as an, an engineer, we always say, with enough time and enough money, you can do almost anything. Um, that's the purpose of mitigation studies to evaluate what the right anything is and what mm -hmm. is identified would or would not happen in here. You know, the, it would certainly be challenging to have a, a large increase in conveyance in order to reduce a hundred-year floodplain on, on one to two parcels in here through the backyards of a number of existing homes and to try and do something through there would likely be fairly expensive and fairly contentious and not necessarily in alignment with the goals of the mitigation plan or the goals of the flood protection program. Yeah, I guess I was thinking more of just trying to, you know, get that pocket of 100-year uh, uh, handled by that ditch, but I'm just not sure. I, I guess not, not through yards, uh, but getting it over to the west and through that ditch and uh, you know, but what I'm trying to point out is that ditch is through the yards, and so the improvement oh, yeah. would so, be to that ditch. So they'd have to there there'd have to be construction and uh, lots of stuff going on. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. All right. What about zoning at RH and allowing a 55 foot 
apartment building and the 500 year floodplain against the road and then leaving the rest of the lot completely empty. I think we'd need a site plan then. A, you know, site review for something. I'm just like putting that. it out there. It seems yeah. like people don't want to touch the 100 year floodplain. That's one way of not doing it. I just want to make a few site dimensional observations for everybody's information. Okay. That's okay. Wait, Brian, do you want to know the setback? Yeah, yeah. What's the setback? It's 20 feet. 20 feet? Okay. So if you guys look at the drawings, um, the house where it sits right now is about 60 feet back from the um, right away based on EMAP link, which is not something we can submit for proper review. But um, so just for visual reference, like the front of the house is about 60 feet back from the um, property line. So there'd be about 40 feet in front of the existing structure that could include any kind of construction after this uh, setback, right? And then if you look at the, um, the farthest east part of the house, that's about 100 feet from the west property line. And that um, west property line has a 50 foot easement along it, right? So if you figure like about halfway back on the house, the house goes like that. Um, you'd have sort of a little bit of space to, to work with. Um, and I would also note that there is that 10 foot dedication along um, South Boulder Road as well. So that takes 10 feet out. So another one. So from the front of the house, which is about where, like if you look at those floodplain maps, that's about where uh, the floodplain hits the south uh, east corner of the house, under your floodplain. Um, you know, moving back left from that to the west, you'd have about 50 feet you could build in, and to the south you'd have about tw uh, 30 feet you could build in. So you'd have a weird trapezoid that's about 45, 50 by about 30, with a triangle on the side. So not a house site. Okay, I, I think I won't be offering an amendment. Okay, you're going to withdraw your motion. Yeah. Okay. My attempt, anyway. Okay. It would be big enough for a tiny house. Crystal, are you ready, are you ready to vote? <laughs> Do you want? Are, is everybody ready to vote? Let's vote. Okay, to, let's uh, vote. Um, we have a motion by Bowen, seconded by who seconded it? I don't remember. Zuckerman. Zuckerman. Yeah. Okay. And it's just the staff motion, right? There's no no yeah, amendment or anything to it. Okay, so um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Can I let the record reflect, or I'll when we do the first. well, uh, there were three opposed. She just needs to say who voted. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Just I'm let here. the record reflect. I probably would have voted for it if, you'd add, if we had been able to add small houses to it. But, you know, council, if that's in the minutes, then council can see it and they might, they do a lot of creative things on annexations. Right. If you'd made that motion, I would have accepted it. Well, I tried to, but I didn't or quite. Okay, hang on. So you had your hand up and then you had your hand up. Do you have something to say? In yeah, I'd just like to say briefly why I voted uh, as I did. I think that given what the city has gone through with the CU South and the, and the principles that the council decided on, and what has recently happened at the uh, Hogan-Pankost property with all of the concern about to flood uh, and hydrology issues there, and with what just took place in the Cherryvale property where we decided not to allow habitable structures in the 100-year floodplain, uh, it seems to me it would be uh, uh, inconsistent with all of those to move ahead and allow construction in, the, in this 100-year floodplain. And for that reason, I oppose the uh, uh, annexation. It seems to me that it does not benefit the city to move ahead with it under those circumstances. Thanks, John. David, did you? Well, I wanted to ask about Crystal's idea uh, on the small homes, um, because it actually is possible to make another motion to try to address that. Is that true? I mean, if, 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 if we may not, I, there may be one thing that I just didn't understand here. We could make a motion to council to consider it, but oh, I see. That would be separate. There's a different set of criteria for us yeah. to revisit a decision okay. that we just. Decided. That's fine, but uh, but I guess um, I don't know if tiny homes is actually uh, 
defined anywhere in the code. Uh, if it were, uh, maybe we could have just simply added it to the list of allowable structures. Mm -hmm. You know, and, or yeah. we we could have maybe considered uh, saying or um, a collection of homes smaller than a certain number of square feet. Mm -hmm. and that would have been a simple way to, to potentially do that. It didn't occur to me until you just made your, that last statement. I'm sorry. I mean, currently, yeah. city staff is through the planning department and, and housing looking at that stuff, and they're saying that there's not going to be any way to do a unit smaller than like 340, right. 350 square feet. Mm -hmm. So that, like other parts of the code preclude, preclude you from doing a tiny home anyways. Yeah. So, so it would, anything, it would have to be limited square footage and a fixed foundation. Yeah. Because we can't do the stuff on wheels anyhow. One of the reasons that, that I was having <coughs> issues with the tiny home concept is the minimum um, lot area uh, of open space per home. Because a, a tiny home with 6,000 square feet of lot area is literally never going to get built with land prices being what they are. And so if you don't have a specific uh, provision saying that you know, five tiny homes equals one unit or something like that to create some economies of scale so that you can afford to run utility connections to five homes instead of one. And when you're paying $70,000 to connect the unit to utilities, um, you need scale when you're doing tiny homes. So that's why I was not interested in that, among other reasons. Yeah. That's a okay, so we are going to, um, when we talk about the letter, there is a section on yeah. tiny homes. So we can have more of this discussion then if we want to. Are we, can we let the applicants go? Are they, are we finished with them? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Congratulations. Have a great holiday. We can move on to the next item. Thank Thanks you, staff. Coming. Thank you, Sloan. Yeah. Little break? No? Yeah, uh, okay. A five minute break to, um, we actually don't need to swap staff out because we're just doing the letter, so. You know what? On the committee.
I got the golden ticket. <gasps> you did. <laughs> I believe in you, Pam. You have to go see the Oompa Loompa. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I got the uh, Are you ready to start? Yes. Let me uh, hit the record. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we are back, and we're going to finalize the 2019 letter to City Council annual letter from Planning Board. And before we start, I want to uh, let everybody know that there was a paragraph that was sent to me by one of the planning board members, and I completely spaced putting it in here. And that was under the resilience thing, the very last paragraph under that section. Um, if, if in here, was it it's in up the one yeah. that was sent to us, Liz? No, I, I just oh. found out tonight when I got here. So. Um, if you could go down to that paragraph, Cindy, then the, it's uh, under, it's the paragraph just above joint board. So it's in the email you sent at 544. Yep. Yep, got it. There we go. Yep, there you go. It's the one that says we need. So, I mean, I don't have any issue with that language. Oh, no, that's not it. Never mind, no, it's the next one up. That one's about energy, that one's, the one that says planning board, just, yeah, the next one. Which one was it? One that says planning board believes. Sure, sounds good. I think that's good, I like it. Sure. I like it. Okay, all right, so how do folks wanna go? Do you wanna just go through it from the top to bottom? Uh, if everybody's read it, then we don't have to do that. You can just tell us which issues, um, w if there are places where you want to change the wording. So there's a, little, a, a lot of things I don't personally agree with or that don't really love, but I, I didn't go to the meeting where we started this off, and out of respect for the folks who did, I'm not going to try to change directions. And also, I feel like this is the kind of thing where it's it does get a little bit Christmas treat, and people add in a lot of their pet things, and I think that's probably fine. Okay, Crystal. So in, in light of tonight's discussion, if you go down to the resilience section, because I think that deals with most of the flood things, mm -hmm. I think we ought to just put in a sentence that says, um, uh, encourage the, the council to develop a Groundwater plan, would that be the appropriate? Well, word? there are BB, there are new BBCP policies about groundwater, so we could encourage council to um, work on implementing the new BBCP policies about okay. flooding and groundwater. So could we put that in? Mm -hmm. Where? Um, and, and then also, what, well, wait a minute, yes. let's, let's let Cindy get that sentence, okay? Let's put it, um, let's put it in its own little paragraph. All right, but it's really just a sentence, but. Because those are <clears throat> long paragraphs. <laughs> uh, maybe after conditions, insert another paragraph. Con oh, there. Yeah. What would you and, say? um. Planning board urges city council to um, direct staff to uh, pursue implementation of the new BBCP policies regarding flooding and groundwater. Something like that. Implementation of, I'm sorry, what? Of BBCP, new BBCP policies. Regarding Flooding, floodplains, and groundwater. How about that? I'll wait till okay. she gets done. And then one other issue is um, identifying lands for floodplain acquisition. Mm -hmm. So urge city council to it could go in that same paragraph. It could be, yeah, to pursue implementation regarding flooding, floodplains, and maybe we could 
Well, in addition, flood plan, prioritize floodplain acquisition. Okay. Hmm. A acquisition slash preserve, uh, yeah, acquisition, because that could become, that could come in many mm -hmm. forms. Okay. Easement, sexual, if it, if you give an easement, you might preserve some development rights on the non-flooding part of the property. I would say just preservation, because then you, it could be acquired, it could be an easement, it could be a land use regulation. Okay, floodplain preservation, and then maybe in parentheses, acquisition, easement, et cetera. Okay. I personally would prefer just preservation, because I'm not sure we've thought through okay. prioritizing acquisition of floodplains. I, I think that would, um, that might need some additional discussion. Well, should, there were three yeah. options. Like Mm -hmm. They were yeah, just, friend. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, okay. that's fine. That? It's okay with me to leave it like that. Okay. I think that part of staff's job is would be to figure out which mechanisms were the best mechanisms. So mm -hmm. preservation is just. I know. I keep moving my mouth. And I'm moving my mouth. <laughs> By the nickel. All right. Good. Does anybody else have any additions or deletions that they'd like to make? Nope. Um, the, uh, I was a little wondering about the growth and in infrastructure part, which I appreciate because people talk about whether we're outgrowing our facilities and that kind of thing. I do think that each, a lot of these are covered under so many of the master plans already. And so I'm wondering how to acknowledge that, in fact, Boulder is, you know, through its master planning, um, master planning, whatever, activities, um, is uh, addressing a lot of this already. I mean, they're, yeah. you know, projecting growth certain level of growth and will we meet that water supply? Do we have the wastewater facilities? Yeah, all that stuff. Stuff like that. There's already being done and it's how they calculate plant investment fees. Like that's where mm -hmm. it gets implemented is all the way through a pretty rigorous study and planning mm -hmm. process with a lot of math and mm -hmm. comes out as fees at the end. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have like a, a summary kind of, a, I don't know if that would be sort of some some kind of a summary that showed where the deficits are, the projected deficits are, or, you know, whatever. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe we should just change it to say something about summarizing the, the uh, products of these ma specific master mm -hmm. plans for yeah. transportation and could we re request it? Planning board requests uh, something like that? Or you could ask for a publicly available dashboard of all those things. Oh, that's a great idea. Thanks. Okay. Recommend a publicly available dashboard? In quotes. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy, do you want to? <coughs> oh, it's up there. We're going to change the wording under growth and infrastructure. Sorry. So it would be planning board recommends a public, <coughs> what's, it, what's it called? Publicly available dashboard. That's what I said. But. That's nice. Yeah, like that. That's good. That. Otherwise they'll think it's in a car. <laughs> <laughs> um, Reflecting. Hey, they're, they're elected officials, you guys. Show yeah. some respect. Uh -huh. Reflecting, and then you can only people delete. Her. No, no, keep going with reflect. Yeah, reflecting. The and then delete everything. We're a model for the country. I think. To overall. So reflecting boulders. Actually, yeah, just like just then keep going and then stop. Reflecting boulders all overall infrastructure capacity. And you can delete be carried out to assist blah, 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 and just go to the content of it. That's it. Remove be carried out. Take that out. Yeah, yeah. Take out out. There you go. 
Yeah, that seems like that would be okay. That would be good. I like yep. summarizing instead of reflecting, though. I think. Sure. So. Yeah. We've heard over and over during the CIP process and stuff like that that the, you know, water supply, wastewater facilities, are a bit like the two th two hundred fifty thousand person level, mm -hmm. and yet we also charge affordable housing projects um, their share of creating the next 100,000 or whatever, which is, I think, one of our main barriers to creating affordable housing. I think this would help us mm -hmm. talk about that with a little bit of fact-based. I love the, I love that, you know, making more data available to us and the public is good for everybody, so. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be making our decisions the, based on facts and information, for sure. Yeah. The, it would be great to have, uh, Brian, just back, if you don't mind, Liz, just back to your point about Co -co different fees for different categories of customers. You know, you've, since water and wastewater are enterprise funds, somebody has to fund them. So then that gets to make sure it doesn't get transferred into the middle income, and that, their, mm -hmm. that rates their rates go up and so you yeah it's a question that figure out how to do it maybe yeah. it comes from another fund to to augment the enterprise fund yeah that's maybe why we have a linkage fee for waste water and yeah. water i wouldn't want to try to get into like i know any of that stuff here it seems like we could just let it go with like let's let's get find it and make it information make it information yeah. that we can look at so are you okay with the new wording of that paragraph? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. All righty. Anybody done. else? Are we done already? Can I, right. can I just pick a couple of nits oh, that please, are not, nits. not important, but I'd like to just standardize <laughs> some language. Um, so we have use table, use tables, and capital L, capital U, capital T land use table. Yeah. And I'd like to just do a word search for use table. <laughs> just make sure that each one just says capital U use, capital T table. Okay. I can't see it. <laughs> can't see what? The toolbar up here. Oh, just okay. Control F. Okay, we'll control find, control F. find them. Oh, thank you. There aren't that many. Do you want it to not be land use table, just call it use, use table? Use table. Just, All right. And there are so no plurals to Under that. public engagement, the first one is... Um, in that first paragraph under public engagement. So make it just use table, not land use table. Improved Take the land table. out. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Okay, and then, and then land hit, use hit it again. Code. You'll have to go back into that box, uh, Cindy. There you oh, go. Okay. okay, so now Why you can click down to the next one. Wait, there's another one. Go back up. There was another one we missed. <laughs> yeah. Land use code. Oh, Do you want oh to? the land use code is Oh, fine. that's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's what it's called. All right. It's an optical illusion. Okay. Where's the next one? So the next one. I thought the same thing. Just take the S off. People are going to wonder where the other use tables are. <laughs> yeah, I came in. I we should have a lot more of them than two. one. Yeah, okay. One table, sir. It's one table. It's one table. One job. Really, table. it's a tiny house restaurant. No, just can you capitalize? Oh, those? there you go. <laughs> Good work. You serve one ravioli, wow. then you're done. I'm sorry, I'm just like that. You guys are going to be sorry you didn't do what I said. Yeah. What did you say? I'll be no, sorry. You not on the can, All of it. Forever, all, everything she's ever said is what she means. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. how I feel. That was when a I'm uniform. Gone, you're when I'm gonna gone, be you're going to be like, where's Liz? <laughs> I think we got them all. Got them all? Okay. Yeah. And then <laughs> on the, the, um, there's a sentence that I don't like too much under private development and public engagement strategies, first page. Okay. Um, so in that introductory sentence, it, it talks about quasi deficiencies in quasi-judicial private development projects. Mm -hmm. um, well, Public engagement. They're not quasi-judicial projects. Yeah. They go through quasi-judicial processes. So I could suggest we could take out a, a new wording. Okay. Um, so public engagement deficiencies in the review of. Okay. There you go. Private right, development. Leave it. In the review of quasi. No, no, we're going to take out quasi judicial. In the review of private development projects. Of quasi, the re, in the review of private development projects subject to quasi judicial approval. Okay. 
Right, so now after projects subject to Quasimodo. Quasi Quasimodo. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Quasimodo. Dash yeah. judicial. Quasimodo. It's gonna be a thing, right? Quasimodo. Quasimodo bike path. Approval. <laughs> Let's get that in the comp next time. Period. We yeah. need quasimodo. See if they're paying attention to us. And then the There's a typo up above. <laughs> God, if I reapply, I could go through another comp plan review. No, you should years. reapply. Oh, I'd have to reply twice. You yeah, should. It's not worth it. Because I'm not going to. And then we don't have to do this now, um, but I always like to Everything will go on. see where wherever the word city is used no, to refer to the city of Boulder, it should be a capital C. And a That's lowercase c refers to all of us, you know, who live in the different neighborhoods and the geographical area. But whenever we're talking about, like, for example, Negotiations between the city and CU South. There, there may be opportunity. The there may be times when that's true, that like that particular one when they're talking about some kind of a legal mm -hmm. entity, but otherwise, you're not supposed to capitalize them. Right. So that's all I'm saying is that where like we suggest that the city look at strategies. We're really talking about council and staff. We're talking about the city as a legal entity, mm -hmm. as a government. And that should be a capital C city. So I don't know if, if Cindy, I don't want to, you know, take yeah. everybody's time, but if, if that's something you could handle I, after we're done. Well, I can do it right here. I'm doing it. Yeah, I'd say it's underway. It's okay. Great. So this one with Look at the money. style guides, though. They don't want to capitalize the style. They don't? Mm -mm. Hmm. This would not. I don't know how you would tell the difference between. The city at large and the city government, if you didn't capitalize the C when you're talking about the government. I don't know. I didn't have any trouble when I was reading it, have that distinction. But mm. it, it is. Well, I think it's, let's just go with what's right, not your opinion or your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually when it's just a proper name that you capitalize it. That's what I thought, too. Yeah, and that's what um, I, I can remember Susan Richstone telling got an, us. That's I got an ally sure. down there with. Mr. Gerstel agrees with me. Well, he's German. They capitalize everything. Yeah. <laughs> when I lived in Germany at 12, I came back and capitalized every noun oh, for a year. And I think it was so much trouble. Now people school. think you're Trump. It's very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Words for governmental or administrative units are only capitalized when they're used as part of a proper noun. It's just the formal name of a city. The first example. I don't know if that really. So wait, you're not going to accept my. Hold on. I'm you're not, not going to accept my opinion, but you're going to trust the internet. That just so man. Five <laughs> seconds on Google. That just came from some some weird website that I don't know. But it's true. I mean, I have a, the Chicago Manual style. Looked it up. And so unless it's city of Boulder, unless there's an of Boulder mm -hmm. or council after the word not, city, no, you would. No, not city. council. There's act in the Chicago Manual style. They actually have an exception for council. Hmm. Yeah. Well, far be it for me to gainsay that. You've been to the Chicago Manual. So. I will defer to. This. <laughs> you use complete name of department capitalized. This is the capitalization of government words. Okay. Okay. So she needs to reapply. <laughs> That's why I have a, the job I have right now. So. Okay. We're good. I think so. Do you have any more? Um, no, I like no? The, uh, the letter quite a bit. I think everybody okay. did a great job. Really it's nice very job. long, though, and that's the only thing. I, I hope they get through it. It's that. broken up nicely in a section. So, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. It's no longer than another board. I think board. you should be proud to sign it. <laughs> okay. That's not even sending one. I guess there was, there not, there was no, one. I felt like it was unnecessary. Having read 160 of these in eight years. Mm -hmm. Brevity. I'm, are you? I'm done. Are we? Are we done? We're done. Well, Harmon was sort of hesitating. About well, you were just talking about how there was. It was long, and I, th I found one sentence um, that we could get rid of. Um, one sentence. So under preservation of existing affordable housing stock, planning board supports preservation and rehabilitation of these mostly multifamily units. Then the next sentence is: We suggest that the city look at strategies to prevent the loss of these units. So I think that sentence about supporting preservation can go because it's really well implied in the next sentence. Mm. And it takes some of our value judgment out of that, which I think would make it more of a unanimous feeling among the board. I suggest the city. Because I support is. looking at strategies, but okay. I'm not sure I always support preservation because some of these oh, housing well. complexes are old and very drafty. 
But that's why they're cheap. And so you... Yeah, but that's why they're pleased to you have, No. no. It's terrible. I'm just you know, well, like what Element's done, what is they... I mean, they've done some great work, right? Element has acquired... So has Boulder Housing Partners through Project Renovate. Okay. But that would so, all fall into the next sentence. Just so if we demolish those... those they I, I do think it's um, redundant to have both sentences. Yeah, I like prevent... Look at strategies to prevent the loss of. That's more wide open. Okay, oh. and the heading says preservation, so... Yeah. yeah. It's taking all right. Family. Good catch. Okay, you can yeah. take that out. Like so that sentence just... We did with them, and they... Yes. Looks good. Okay. Oh, and then put multifamily uh, instead of these providing units. Providing some common space that people can share. I can. As we yeah. took out. Prevent the loss of multifamily yeah. units. Yeah. That's great. Of these multifamily yeah. units. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's mostly multifamully, though. It's not necessarily all multifamily. Well, actually, actually yeah. so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we're, we're really so just talking about affordable units, so it doesn't, maybe we don't need the multifamily there. But we need something because we didn't refer to a these before. So we have to get rid of these and put something there. Prevent the loss of affordable units. Uh, affordable, whatever. Uh, well, we're talking. Uh, we, we we took out the reference to units in the previous sentence, uh -huh. so we can't say these units. That's all. So okay. Maybe change it to this housing stock to refer back to. Just say lots of units and take the these out. Because yeah, the yeah. title is preservation oh, of I existing see, yeah. affordable housing stock. I think we just take out the the word these. Should say market loss of units. I yeah, guess that's I agree with okay. Liz. It's the most. Oh, it does say market right, rate. Because yeah, section is it called does. existing affordable housing stock, and done. I think there's an extra space after through and before review on that same sentence. There you go. Hey, look what's coming up next. You got it. Okay. Yeah, Brian wrote a section for us on tiny homes, which I thought was good, and I thought no change in wording at all. Kept it short. It's very nice. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Sing, arrange singly or in pocket neighborhoods. But you forgot to put forward. in the floodplain. No, <laughs> it wasn't like tiny homes must be in the floodplain. It's all that's left anyway, off. so. Put them in the floodplain. <laughs> We're done, I think. Before we adjourn, I have two things. Okay. Um, I just want to let you know that starting next year, before a meeting, probably the day before, I'm going to be sending something called a quorum check uh. and uh, just making sure... Um, I have the right number of people that are going to be attending or not attending. Um, it's going to be something we're going to be putting in place with all boards. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's going to be what? We're going to be doing that for all our boards. Okay. Just doing this quorum check. Cindy, there was, there's something that, that I, I don't have chapter and verse, but in the code around 48 hours it's notice cool thing. for absences. Rings of that do you think it makes sense to do it 24 hours or to you try to conform it mm -hmm. to the code and do it 48 hours ahead of time? I'd be happy to. Okay. Yeah, I, we haven't set it in stone. I haven't written up a template You yet just might want to bring that up with Hella or something or see how you feel about this going was, two days instead of one. Yeah, that's fine. This is this was uh, Chris Meschuk's idea, and I think okay. it's a great one. Because I, I think we're supposed to notify within 48 hours if we're going to be absent, so issues. this would be a good backstop for us. It's not because of you guys. We've had some issues. I know, okay. I know who it is. Really? Oh, but I'm not telling. Oh, okay. So just anyway, what's your other die thing? Die with me. I have another. You don't need this I just want to let you know that tomorrow, um, because of the holidays, I know you're all going to be busy and doing your own thing, but I will be sending out a call up tomorrow, um, and the expiration date on that will be January 4th. So I just want to let you know that I'm sending that out via okay. email tomorrow to just kind of keep your eyes on it. Right. We'll have some time in there, but just want to let you be aware. Okay. Will it be posted on our website? Any, what do we do with call-ups? They're just posted as part of the agenda, but since this occurs... When we have a call-up that happens mid-packet time, um, they're just sent, sent out via email to you. And um, I will let you know in the email the expiration date and who you should contact in the staff. And then there's a notification within 600 feet to the people. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. If, if any member of the public can call something up, how would they know that this is something that's capable of being called up? They, well, there's the public notice that goes out, I believe. Okay. So. Sign posting. They assume most people get wind of call-ups when they look at what we're looking at. They learn about it more or less when we do. The majority yeah. of people. Yeah. So in this, this is an example of where they have to be extra tuned in. Yeah. Well, I think actually most people find out through the neighborhood notification stuff. Because, I mean, honestly, we get a lot of emails from folks 
way before it even gets on our radar because it's already yeah. happening in the communities. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't really think our agenda is what triggers it. Yeah. When's our next meeting? Uh, 17th of January. Okay. And then we will have one immediately the next week for the 24th of January. Okay. And is that it? We have two in January? Yes. Or do we have one on the 31st of January? No. Okay. <laughs> and could, could I just ask, does anyone know if they're not going to be here on the 17th or the 7th of February at this point? Because mm -hmm. I'm struggling with both of those dates. Um, but I'm going to try to come back for the 17th. Wait, February? Of, uh, 17th of January, 7th of February. Okay. Doesn't sound like Go I'm competing on. with a lot of other people who are not going to be here. So um, I'm going to really try to make it back for, for the 17th at least. On the 7th of February, I will be on a plane for Europe. So that one I don't think is a possibility. Okay. No. okay. Right. 17th and 24th? Uh, 17th uh, yes. and, and 20, well, 24th, I'll be here. Okay. Okay. That's all I have. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So any other matters? Okay, John's got one. Um, just to let you know, I was at the RAB meeting uh, on Monday, and uh, I would say they suffered a lot more with producing their letter than we did for <laughs> ours. So congratulations to Liz. On uh, thank you. Uh, well, everybody pitched in, except yeah. Peter. <laughs> I know. Good job, though. You did awesome. I know who's doing it next year. <laughs> well, I'll a singer. Um, All right. And uh, it Thanks, was, uh, they, I can just let you know that the new billing portal and web page is being set up for the water utility. So those who are interested might have a lot of fun entertaining themselves with that. Great. Thank you. All righty. We're done. Thank you. Seven. Happy That's holidays, fun. everyone. Yeah. Yeah, Enjoy. you too. Great year. Merry everything. Yeah. Live from Paris, on France 24.